Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland. Thank you. Advise members, obviously, that we're all welcome. Wi-Fi connection, mobile devices, etc. 
Uh, four members of the revised draft agenda was circulated today. The revision is due to the receipt of the Committee Office of an Emergency SL1. It is considered for consideration as we already discussed. If members are content, are content to proceed with the revised agenda, we are content. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, seek agreement and members are content to consider the SL1, which purpose is to extend financial support agreed for London, Derry and Straban. We I think we have agreed to that. Agreed. Content to proceed through the agenda. Uh, there are no apologies at present. Uh, we have had no notice of any member receiving uh, to delegate authority another member to vote under a temporary standing order. Uh, obviously, no apologies. We're all here. Yep. And uh, a note to remind members: they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest at each committee meeting as applicable. Uh, members, I have I have an announcement to make. We will be considering a correspondent letter from the Girl Guides Association, and my both daughters are brownies, so I thought it would be appropriate <laughs> to make sure to that you was. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, just to declare as well, uh, I'm a member of Credit Union. Credit <coughs> Union. We have with the Girls Brigade. Brigade. Yep. Credit yep. uh, if we move on to the draft uh, uh, minutes of the proceedings of 14th of October, draft minutes of the meeting are at page five. Gemma, you were, got the award for spotting the mistake last time. No, not this time. <laughs> <laughs> Members, are we content that the minutes are an accurate record of proceedings? Agreed. And we are content for the minutes to be published on the website. Agreed. Okay. Minutes are rising. Uh, item number three. The minutes of the meeting of 7 October have been amended to reflect the timings of the oral evidence on subordinate legislation and ask the members if they are content with amendments to the draft minutes. Are we content? Uh, next item is expenditure under the sole authority of the Budget Act. Uh, and thank you, uh, Jim Allister, for your diligence work yet again on black boxes and raising these issues. Uh, and four members a response from the Department in reply to the request for copies of the approvals provided by Supply Division for expenditure under the sole authority of the Budget Act and Memorandum of Understanding is tabled at page four. I'd like to advise you that in two areas, welfare mitigations in the Department for Communities and Good Relations in TEO, the Department of Finance states that although a verbal agreement was given to include the provisions under sole authority of the Budget Act, written confirmation was not issued. Uh, that I've briefed, we have briefed the Minister. He's aware of our attention to raise this issue, this matter with him today, and I hope he will address that. And indeed, I raised that in remarks in the Assembly yesterday. I would like us to reschedule uh, or to schedule some oral evidence with officials on this matter after the Halloween recess and also to ask the Department to provide details of all items for which sole authority of the Budget Act was granted in each of the last decade. I think it should be out to the last 10 years because when I started doing some research on it, it looked as if this has been a policy for quite a considerable period of time. And we would like to see the written of the, uh, copies of the written approval for each if we are content. Content. Remind members that during last week's evidence session, officials assured the committee that the appropriate levels were in place, which regrettably they weren't. Uh, I am aware, members, that we will have seen a uh, document that is likely to be released tomorrow, and I don't think it would be opposite if we raise this in this discussion during this committee meeting, and we allow the other committee to do its business and raise those issues. But. I think we are all aware of the issues they have raised, and from that, I think there will be a lot of um, corresponding work we will look to after that has been. And I understand that that will be tabled as papers for us uh, on our next session. I think it's on the fifth of, fourth of on the fourth of November. So uh, I don't like speaking obliquely, but I think in this case, I think I do have to speak obliquely about that. But I think I think that would be appropriate if we had that on the fourth of November, and that will further inform our decisions if we are content. Great, thank you. And uh, I think we also need to provide the department the opportunity to formally write to the committee to correct the record in this matter, because indeed, and I genuinely believe the official wasn't trying to mislead us, but he did make a statement on the record and answered. But I think he should have the opportunity to correct. Are we agreed to write to do that? Great. Okay. Uh, and four members, a letter from the Minister tabled at page 13 informs the committee that officials are not in position to brief the committee at this meeting as scheduled due to the focus of COVID-19 situation. This is by the October monitoring round. 
Do we have any comments, Paul? Uh, yeah, the reason why October monitoring round has been uh, postponed, have we got the reason? Maybe that's a question you might ask us, the Minister, in a couple of minutes. Table papers, page 13. Yeah, 13. Yeah, yeah. So they're saying basically they need to focus on the emerging COVID-19 situation, which I'm sh something that must have crept up on them, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, ask, we'll ask the Minister. Yeah. Okay, I thought that would be more appropriate if we did that at the stage. Anybody else to wish to make any comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, can we invite the uh, Minister and Joanne to come in? Or maybe not. Hi, Connor. Come on, on in. Hi, Joanne. Good to see you. Uh, ben, welcome, Minister, and Thank welcome, you. Joanne. Welcome to uh, see you again. It's like uh, long lost friends back <laughs> in again. Um, we're having oral evidence on the impact of the Chancellor's decision to cancel the UK budget on the, on the Assembly budget for 21 22. Uh, I'd advise the members that the session is being recorded by Hansard. Uh, the clerk's brief this is page 26. The budget 21 22 timetable is at page 28. Uh, the update in the Ireland Northern Ireland protocol costs is at page 30. Uh, there's a note from William Cash on uh, the Shared Prosperity Fund, and that's on tabled at page 16. And there's a letter from the Construction Employers Federation regarding the upcoming spending review on page 32. Connor, be delighted if you would uh, make your opening statement. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I just intend to make a few brief remarks, and then because I always find it much better if we get straight into questions and dialogue. Uh, Members are probably aware at this stage that the uh, announcement was made this morning that the comprehensive spending review will be for one year only. Uh, firstly, it was disappointing for ourselves in the finance department uh, to hear that on the media and not directly from the Treasury. Uh, and that's something I have a conference call this afternoon with the, both the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers and the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, so it's something that we will be raising with them. Uh, it's disappointing because uh, members will have known from the last couple of days in particular when we were debating these issues in the chamber and discussing them, uh, not only was there a new decade, new approach commitment to tr get to a situation of multi-annual budgeting, uh, but it's something that we, and I think universally across the chamber, that people were in agreement uh, that would be much better in terms of our planning. It's much better in terms of management of public funds and this idea of trying to spend out at the end of the financial year. Uh, so it, it is very disappointing that for next year at least we are into uh, an annual budget again. Uh, I hope that's the last one that we have uh, for the foreseeable future. But uh, that uh, decision has been taken obviously in terms of the government and London's response to COVID and all of the pressures it's facing, and it's decided to go uh, with one which is primarily focused on that response uh, and go for a, a one-year budget. That then in turn obviously uh, knocks on into our. Uh, issue in terms of the, the timing of it, the Chancellor announced today it would be late November. Again, that is not ideal for us because, as you will know, we need to know the funding envelope we have. We now know the time frame we're operating from, but we need to know the funding envelope. We want to get out and begin consultation with yourselves, uh, with other committees. Uh, I, I'm beginning the round of consultation with executive ministers. I think starting next week. Uh, and a series of meetings scheduled over the coming weeks to meet individually with uh, executive ministers to hear from their departments in terms of what their budget outlook is. They will know now that we're having a different conversation in terms of time frame, uh, but nonetheless, those are important uh, conversations. But uh, in terms of getting you know, the maximum consultation both in this institution and, importantly, outside in the community in terms of, uh, of developing a budget, uh, November, and we, we don't have any time frame for that. And on occasions, that has run into the first week in December, is is not a good time for a consultation, and you're straight into the Christmas break. Uh, so it, it it leaves it fairly compressed, uh, and it's not ideal for any of us, and I'm sure yourselves as much as ourselves in the department. Uh, so we, as I say, we we don't know as yet uh, what the funding envelope is going to be. I'm sure, given the previous discussions, both myself and the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers have had with Treasury collectively 
that we'd be pressing them as early as possible for some information in relation to that to assist with all our planning. It, it affects uh, those devolved institutions as well as our own. Uh, so we will continue to press that today. Uh, and whether that gives us any more indication earlier than perhaps even the announcement is, is something to be seen. Treasury are fairly good at playing their cards close to their chest uh, and, and making, you know, holding back in terms of announcement any information uh, until they announce it themselves. Uh, but I think it's in all our interests that we get the earliest possible information in relation to that. So uh, it's, I suppose that's just by way of introductory remarks, Chair. It's, it's not ideal. Uh, it, it, we already were in a not ideal situation, but the fact that we're now down to an annual budget, I think, uh, and, and a late announcement in, in terms of it really does put pressure on our own processes. But we'll obviously press for as early as information as possible and try and get that consultation going both in this institution and outside as well. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, Minister, and thanks very much indeed for the remarks. Um, just, a, just a couple of bits and pieces. Have we had any indication at all, and I know it will be a one-year <coughs> settlement, but are the indications it will be fairly similar to what was the baseline for 1920 or 2021? Have you got a, even an indication of a baseline to work for? Because even though we are not going to get a multi-year budget or an indication of a comprehensive spending review, we probably have sufficient information from the outcomings and also from the, you know, we've already heard uh, uh, evidence from your officials about, you know, you're getting monthly feedback from the various departments. We should be in a position where we can at least put a quite strong framework together for a one-year budget. Well, I would think that would be probably the case in any ordinary year. But you remember, we've had a huge amount of COVID spend, uh, which has been going through departments as well. So it is possibly skewed. Uh, that we have the uncertainty in terms of both COVID and what might be required in further spending, particularly for health, but also in supporting uh, businesses and supporting the economy. Uh, and then we have the Brexit factor as well. So while you know we will press, we're, we're obviously into a different conversation now with Treasury only from this morning. Uh, so we will press then for more certainty in terms of what the baseline might look like. Uh, even an early indication of that, as, as you suggest, would be helpful. Uh, but there is a huge amount of uncertainty there, uh, and, and so it might be difficult. Joanne McBurney here obviously is, is one of the key people to uh, dialogue with Treasury officials, so she might have some more information on that. Yeah, I um, suppose so just, just to add, I mean, our baseline, Treasury have informed us what our baseline for the spending review would be, but that strips out an awful lot of things which we would have had this year the COVID money, as the Minister referenced, but also some of the NDNA money. Which means that our starting point, if the starting point is our baseline, we're already more than 350 million down on what departments would have had at the start of this year, regardless of, of the uh, the COVID money that came in. Uh, we were talking to Treasury just about lunch time today. We were pressing them for some information on that, and there isn't a lot they can share with us at the minute. They were saying they were were working towards a multi-year spending review, and what all they could share with us is that, with it now being a one year, it's going to be a very different settlement. And I got the feeling that they were maybe nearly starting from scratch themselves in developing a spending review outcome. Because it's quite important. Because I mean, the figure, and we asked the question about how much was the ask, particularly to get ourselves for Brexit preparations. The rest of it was, I think, it was 318 million. Mm -hmm. Was the question? No, mm -hmm. we need to have that sort of baseline within the system before the end of December, not before the end of the financial year. So that's an, another factor <coughs> that needs to be put in. So, are we getting any indications that they're already looking at that, or have we still have we had no response yet? There is a bid in with the Treasury <coughs> for that, that um, and they are looking at it. We're, we're back and forward answering queries on that at the minute. Um, they haven't given us an indication of timeline, other than they're looking at it. Um, sometimes these things all tend to come together in the spending review outcome. We'd be hopeful of getting actually uh, an agreement from them before then, because some of the costs relate to this year. But all we can do is continue to press them for that. It's also tangled up, as you know, with the negotiation. So, uh, for Treasury on behalf of the government to announce they're going to be spending X, Y, Z in terms of protocol arrangements, yeah. uh, you know, from their perspective, uh, and we wish that uh, a deal was worked out at this stage, so you know, businesses and others here could have the certainty, and the population could have the certainty about what this is going to look like. Uh, but you know, it, it, given that the deadline for that is the 31st of December. It may be the case that we don't have a very clear indication of what those costs are. There is a principle in principle commitment to match or to meet the costs that, that arise from the protocol. And of course, as Joanna said, both DERA and I think DOE have, have, have uh, presented us, uh, we've gathered those up and presented them. 
there are questions going on about them, but there may be some of this is held back in negotiating terms rather than in the strict analysis of the financial issues at stake here. Okay. And of course, the other thing is that one of the things, if we're looking at the profiling of the, the monies we have at the moment, and I think you made st- yesterday, I think it was in the, I think it was maybe as a response to question to me about how we're going to profile the money and whether we need to spend it to make sure that we don't actually hand anything back. Mm. One of the key things about next year and the budget is what is the ability we have to transfer between capital and resource and necessary to either carry forward. Now, you've alluded, you alluded in the Assembly several times that there's something you would want to do, but if you've got a figure in mind or a percentage that you're looking to achieve? Well, I, I maybe just deal with the principle of it first, and perhaps Joanne can deal with any, any figures. I think in terms of managing our own money, the idea, even in an annual budget situation, is not, which is not where we want to be, that we, we get to the, the, the last quarter of the financial year, and, and, and the imperative then is to spend the money to make sure we don't have So it's obviously good that you can spend the money, and undoubtedly there are schemes waiting in the wings that can use it up, but it's not in terms of overall financial planning. It's not a good place to be. So I think if we had flexibilities in terms of carryover uh, and also flexibilities in terms of capital to resource, uh, then that would allow us both to manage that in-year thing more uh, better, but also to, to manage a longer-term spend as well. And that, I think that would probably have perhaps more benefit in a multi-annual situation than even in an annual situation. So in principle, we have looked for those. We, we don't have a, a a sum in mind or uh, you know, uh, something that we are planning to do with, but I think in principle it puts us in a better position. It's the same position that both Scotland and Wales are adopting, uh, well, and, and we we're jointly they're... have been pressing for that. Have they, been, have they got a figure in mind or a percentage in mind? Uh, Brad? I don't think they have a specific figure in mind. Yeah, um, I think it's more they, on the principle of it's, it's more the principle of the flexibility to allow us to manage our own budgets more effectively. Yeah. But at the moment we have we have a, a limited figure in terms of it's like less than a percent. It's yes, but resource dale is not point six percent of our, yeah. our final resource yeah. dale, which is relatively so. small. Okay. Um, and the sort of the final one before I'll sort of open up to other people. Um, one of the issues we obviously had with sort of Brexit and with the internal markets bill, we were told that a lot of the information was going to come through on the finance bill, mm-hmm. and I have seen no indications from Westminster whatsoever about a finance bill coming. So do you have any information about the supposed finance bill that's going to answer a lot of our questions, particularly on sort of east uh, east to west trade and those issues? No, is a short <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> Is the short answer. Sorry, I, had, you know, I already knew the answer, but I just wanted to make sure that you weren't uh, and, and the particular issue with the internal market bill is we have, uh, like whatever but the, the executive's view on Brexit as a, as a, a policy and as a concept and as a decision taken uh, against our wishes, but the, uh, the executive does agree that any replacement of EU funding, which has been committed to uh, by the government, uh, is replaced in kind. Uh, and that the executive would have the responsibility for designing and allocating uh, funding under programmes that it designs to meet its own particular priorities and needs. The internal market bill has created a power where, whereby that is done from Whitehall. Uh, and that's completely uh, against the not only the, I suppose, the commitment that we understood it to be in terms of Brexit itself, but also in terms of devolved uh, functions. Uh, both and, and Scotland and Wales have the same issue we have uh, uh, in relation to that. So that's another issue that we've been jointly pressing on. But uh, I think certainly alarm bells are ringing with us uh, in terms of the idea that we would individual community projects here would have to apply to Whitehall. Uh, people set over there would set uh, funding programmes without any la- knowledge of, of what the situation is on the ground here. Now, we still obviously have Peace Plus here, which we will uh, administer and allocate ourselves. But all of that other EU funding uh, is, uh, I think, is something that we want certainty on in terms of the quantum of it and also the, the administration and distribution of it. I think there are also concerns, just as an aside, uh, in relation to the replacement of the agricultural funding for farming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, I saw communication today from the Welsh uh, government as well, which shared the same concerns that we have highlighted with Treasury in relation to certainty uh, around the replacement of cap funding as well. So these are worrying times in terms of not just Brexit, but also in terms of what has been committed to uh, replacing EU spending in the devolved administrations as well. Um, and just a final point. Uh, thank you for preparing. I think I put in an AQW about looking at bids that particularly come from the Department of Economy and sort of profiling of support 
and particularly what we're trying to do for sort of excluded companies and excluded people who haven't been managed to get any financial support so far. And I note, looking through the sort of the bid, there seems to be an awful lot of money that has gone through the Department of Economy, has gone to things like supporting consultancy and works with an Invest and I and the rest of it. And there seems to be precious little cash that has actually gone from the Department of the Economy to businesses and people who actually need it. I note, and I will say this, that I note that the Department of Finance, in making its decisions and getting cash out to people who actually need it, has demonstrated that things can be done quickly in government. But I also note that um, we haven't had any response yet from the Department of Infrastructure as a bid to be able to pay for haulage coaches or taxi drivers. I don't see anything in the correspondence you give back to me that it looks as if the Department of Economy has gripped what they need to do. So what, do we have an indication of the quantum that is available still to support business out there? Because you know, just in my rough bit of maths about what's already been calculated and what hasn't already gone out, I think there's a figure that's not far off about 300 million there that needs to be allocated. And if we assume that some money will come back from health, and I'm not, I'm not privy to the sort of the detailed working outs of it. I mean, 300 million could make an enormous difference to Northern Ireland businesses in a short period of time. We do have to spend it unless we can carry it forward. But we've got to get this money across the line before the end of the financial year. So, yeah. could I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to sort of pick holes in other uh, <coughs> industries or whatever it is. But this is a lot of money that could be used for our businesses and business support, bearing in mind what we've just heard over the last sort of 24 hours. But would you care to comment on that, Minister? Yeah, well, there are a number of, if you like, pots of money. Uh, I mean, it, they can all be merged into the one, but uh, essentially we, we had been holding back £55 million, pounds, roughly, uh, because it has been a topic of conversation at the executive for some time, uh, and obviously in the chamber and committees as well, that there were a number of sectors who, who have received no support at all, uh, and for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, you know, some of that was uh, dispute between departments as who had responsibilities, some of its data issues in terms of finding schemes to support people. So I've always been determined to try and do as uh, and adopt, as you suggested, the can-do attitude about getting support out onto the ground as quick as we can. And businesses, and I, mean, I spent most of this morning right up to just before the meeting engaging with various business sectors, and they will tell you it's cash they need. They need job support and they need cash. Uh, uh, and so I think we need, and I don't think they need consultants to tell them how their business is doing right. in, in the middle of a pandemic and a Brexit crisis. So uh, I, I, I've been very clear in relation to that. So we've held back £55 million. Pounds, uh, and I think it's all the more acute the people who haven't yet received support when we're now into the second round of support for some businesses. So some of the, some of the applications we're receiving and the money that we'll be getting out, hopefully by the end of this week, those businesses already received support, so I think it's more acute that those who have been left out are uh, managed to be addressed. Uh, and I mentioned that in the Assembly, uh, as an aside, uh, and it just struck us last week that the small B and B sector who have missed out could have been picked up and should have been picked up. Uh, it was simply a matter of the tourist board verifying their existence because they're on the domestic rate space, not on the non-domestic, uh, and we've managed to pick them up in this scheme, so they will get support in this scheme, but they haven't previously. There's a, a question of, of addressing the, the, the lack of support they had er, earlier. So we want to do that. We, of course, have the 200 million from last Friday that you know about, and there will be a return from health, I think, as well. So while it is significant in terms of money that needs to be spent, in terms of the overall issue facing the economy, uh, I don't think it's still enough. And the key issue in the middle of all of that will be job support. And the, the job support scheme, which now does recognise that people are in restrictions and, and shut down again, uh, is still very, very restrictive and very limited in terms of the support it will offer uh, to employees. And I think that's going to be a big challenge for us in the time ahead. Uh, but yes, there is, in our terms, a significant enough pot. But in terms of the damage that the economy has shipped, you know, I, I, it's not going to answer every question. But the sooner we can get it out to people, then at least we can offer some level of support to them. And I am waiting on schemes to be brought forward by other departments. I'm told even today that there are some suggestions that schemes are on their way through. Uh, so I think for all our sakes, the earlier that they can come through, uh, be assessed by our own department and a recommendation go to an executive meeting, then the better for all of those people. Yeah, look, we have heard, and all MLAs here have heard lots of uh, sort of 
discussions about sort of how some departments have managed to move on using LPS data, and some have been able to access HMRC data very well. And yet other departments are complaining they're not getting access to the data. There seems to be a breakdown in communications amongst the departments. And one of the things is that there is best practice. Um, I don't know how we encourage, and maybe we as a committee will make very clear to the other committees, but if there's best practice being done by sort of the likes of LPS and also the Department of Finance getting the money out of the door, the other, the other departments need to be doing the same thing. Well, well I think we're in fortune in the sense that it's fairly straightforward. We have LPS in the department. Now, they have cross-checked data because when it comes to uh, various, uh, particularly close contact services, they will use the Council Environmental Health data to verify that they've certified these people. They're now using the Northern Ireland Tourist Board data to verify the small B&Bs. Uh, so they do cross-check with other data systems. But yes, I think you're right. This, the sooner we have that, that kind of sharing of data among the various departments and arms length bodies to make sure we can pick up people in the better. Oh, part of our study into the reform of the Northern Ireland Civil Service then? Okay. Okay. Thanks for that, Minister. Paul? Yes, thank you, Minister. You raised a very important issue uh, with regards to BMBs on the uh, domestic rate. It, it was a massive issue last time round that they had dropped out of any support. And you, you did say about the <coughs> dashboard being used to register those. Uh, are the BMBs involved notified, or will they be notified or advertised uh, so that they are aware? Because some of them are so cash strapped and their heads are so down that they maybe wouldn't see a new scheme opening and think it would be for them. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's not that the tourist board have been used to rescue them. The, the data that the tourist board hold, uh, as you know, anybody with six bedrooms, I think, are under. I know Ian Snowden's coming in after, and he, yeah. he will have much more detail on than either myself or Joanne will have. But anybody with six bedrooms are under come in on the domestic rate system. So uh, the LPS weren't able to differentiate between those homes and ordinary domestic homes because there was no uh, information to, to separate that out. Uh, when we met with the excluded people, some of them represented of the small B&B sector, and they said, you know, I mean, Tourist Board certify us. They will, have, they will have details of all of us. So I would imagine then if the Tourist Board, which probably gives them some grant aid or whatever at, at certain times, certainly at least verifies that they're fit for habitation for our, our tourists, uh, they, that, that, that data will be got through. Now, we have told the, the representative people who came to us that they will now be included, so I'm hoping that they will spread that. But uh, I, I would imagine that at the very least the tourist board data have already contact details so that people will be able to advise that they can avail of the scheme. So uh, and when Ian Snowden comes in later, he'll probably be able to give you more certainty in relation to that. The statement you made a couple of weeks ago with regards to needing flexibility with the all devolved regions, uh, and whilst I understand the requirement and the need and the want for that flexibility, it surprised me at the level of concern it raised out there in the uh, private sector. Uh, people are concerned when ministers start to talk about removing capital money. Uh, can you reassure those companies that uh, it is just to have the affordability of agility and, the, and flexibility, and that there isn't some master scheme in tow at the present time with regards to how you're going to spend that money. No, it's, it, uh, if, if people are, are concerned that there's intention to raid the capital budgets just to supplement the resource budgets so we can spend on programmes and things, that's not the case at all. The, 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 I, and you'll know yourself, and, and most MLAs will know this from, from being here for some time, capital programmes can often get tripped up through no fault of their own. There's a planning issue, there's a, a JR taken into them, and they get held up. So the profile of that capital spend, uh, it's, it's much easier to transfer a resource to other areas than it is to capital. Uh, so it's not a plan to try and say raid, because I'm sure the Department for Infrastructure and others uh, would, would, would not tolerate such a plan to try and raid capital budgets to supplement resource. It's simply to say at the end of the year where issues have happened with capital, it's much more difficult to spend. Even you know people will be aware uh, you know, a lot of money at the end of the financial year is used for road service. But that patching uh, thing that road service does comes out of resource. So if it's resurfacing, it comes out of capital. Those, those things are much harder to get going, in the, in the, particularly in the winter months at the end of the year. So capital is harder to, to spend out and harder to shift. And it's not, it's not some plan, as I said, to raid capital budgets to supplement the resource ones. It's, it's really to ensure that there's a flexibility there where there isn't a possibility of spending the capital that and, we can do something with it. And, and can you assure us that there isn't a, 
looking in from other, or looking out from other departments with regards to your statement in that they may well not spend departments may not well spend all of their capital funds in case it may turn into resource and then they may well use it well for, firstly I say that we, we haven't got any certainty or assurance that we can do this so it would be very foolish of a department to have that in the back of their mind because it might not materialize and secondly joanne could get me right if a department's not spent that it has to surrender it back to center for reallocation so they can't decide we won't spend on capital project and we'll transfer that ourselves into resource and spend it elsewhere that's right and, and as well as that because we're aware of the potential issues this year i mean our capital budget's fully allocated but we're aware that there could be potential issues so the supply teams are keeping in close contact with the departments and are asking them to inform us as soon as possible if they think there's any slippage with the idea that then it could be diverted to other capital programs not to transfer to resources the minister says that would sort of be a fail safe if, if, if we couldn't transfer to useful capital okay. programs uh, and of course uh probably that agility and flexibility is monitoring rounds and we now have been told that the October morning round has been delayed. Can you give us any information <coughs> about that and where, when yeah. we can expect that? It's, it was simply the case that when the executive decided only yesterday week, actually early this morning, a week ago, uh, to, to move with restrictions, and we were moving, we had already in place the Derry City Straban scheme to try and assist those uh, areas, and then we knew very quickly we were going to have to move that to uh, 11 council scheme. Uh, and then quickly after that, we learned we were getting 200 million from Treasury, so we were able to increase the amount. So this was all happening in the department in the space of a couple of days. And I think we've talked about a week's delay in relation to the monitoring round. So it was really just to give us the space to get an emergency response out the door uh, and, and to, to park the monitoring round for a week. But the intention is to come next week with yeah. that. Yeah. It, it is. Depar departments, because we commissioned monitoring rounds in advance, departments had submitted bids for, say, COVID funding mm -hmm. before the restrictions had actually been put in place. Mm -hmm. But it was also important to give them a chance to review those bids. So we, we've allowed them to do that over the weekend, and they're coming in now with a, a revised position. And as Minister said, it's only going to be a short delay, we hope. And John, you talked earlier, the uh, question from the, the Chair, about £350 million down. Yeah. On the envelope. Can you explain that for me again? Because my mind's a bit primitive. <laughs> There's things. a lot of figures flying yeah. about. Uh, no, the 350 million. Uh, part of the new decade, new approach gave us 350 million this year for just for budget pressures. So that went into sort of the overall pot and was allocated to general budget pressures and departments, which means that departments have that funding being spent on things which are recurrent, and those pressures will still be there next year. But our baseline has that 350 million removed because it was a one-off allocation. So in order to just stand still, we need to get more than three hundred and fifty million additional in the spending review. Got you now. Yep, I'm clear now in my mind. Thank you, Minister. Can I raise an issue? Uh, it's not related to finance, but it is related to transparency and confidence that this committee would have. And that is around the emails that was supplied from your department eventually uh, to this committee around the PP order, and it's very clear that the officials from this jurisdiction sent. Uh, very helpfully sent your press statement to uh, the government department down south, uh, and then they came back very quickly to say that the announcement was unhelpful and it did not reflect where we were at. I could go on and read it out, but I think I've read it out three times in the committee so far. My question is, what happened to that email exchange, and how was it impacted in the department? Because there was a quite a clear process there by which the government official down south wanted something to be corrected immediately and the official here said that she completely understood and that she would speak to the press office. When did the press office find out? What did they do about it? And when did you find out, Minister, or your permanent secretary for that matter, and how was it rectified? Well, it was, uh, it was from an official. It was a view that perhaps we were uh, and it was a consequence of hearing the press conference that we had done, I think, I think it was on a Friday evening, uh, and a view that perhaps we weren't uh, as far down the line as we were hoping that we were in relation to the uh, contract, even though we had agreed jointly to operate a contract together. Uh, and the advice was that perhaps we should just be more, I suppose, circumspect about where this might go. I uh, then, I think, 
early that week, spoke in the Assembly on a number of times in relation to it, in which I caveated my remarks with all of that. Uh, and so that's what I had done. I have to say, and fair enough, you're entitled to follow these things wherever you wish to follow them. Uh, but we did deliver an order for PPE. We, we spent £60 million. The PPE that staff and Alton and Galvin and all of the hospital systems that are now under pressure are using uh, was that order alongside the order we assisted the Department of Health. At their request, they came to us and asked us for help. Uh, it's not our department's role to procure PPE for anyone else, but we offered help to another department in stress, uh, and that's the PPE staff are currently using uh, at this time. So, as I say, you're entitled to pursue that issue in relation to it if that's what you wish to do. Uh, I'm more pleased that you know, my department officials continued uh, for weeks and weeks after that to get back on track in terms of placing an order successfully, placing an order in a very, very challenging uh, commercial situation in China where half the world was basically turned up on their doorstep looking for PPE and successfully delivered that, as well as successfully assisting, assisting the Department for Health in securing the, the necessary supplies from the NHS England uh, and brought over to it as a stopgap measure in relation to PPE. So uh, I think the Department is to be congratulated for the work they did on it. That, for me, uh, it's an important issue to you, but for me, it's, it's a sideshow in relation to the overall scheme of things. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Alicia. Uh, five years old. I'm to you how I you. are very welcome this evening again. I think a lot of the areas that I was actually <coughs> considering coming in on have been touched on already. Uh, PPEs wasn't one of them. I thought that was dead and buried a long time ago. But notwithstanding that, um, uh, just your comments, Minister, on uh, the transfer from capital to resource, and that I'm sure that will be welcomed by the construction uh, employee federation because in their letter they expressed their concern there that in some way it might affect capital projects per se, and they even went so far as to nearly imply that um, uh, that some departments. Uh, would use it as an instrument, maybe just for that movement of monies and so on. But I think your answer has uh, reassured uh, everyone in that area. Uh, again, uh, our chair um, uh, reflected on the uh, internal market bill, uh, and in the event of it being uh, instigated, and in as much as that it's been held there uh, as a threat at present. Uh, and the benefit of this again, how do you feel, Minister, might that undermine the powers of this devolved assembly? Well, uh, firstly, in relation to the Construction uh, uh, Employers Federation, I mean, we, we talk to them on a regular basis. They're actually represented on our procurement uh, function in the department as well, and there's ongoing engagement with the construction sector. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not surprised people raise questions when we're trying to have flexibility about what that means for capital programmes. But the executive have agreed that we want to pump prime economic recovery with with capital spending and, and try and get capital programmes out. And in the middle of the pandemic, when the uh, lockdown had happened and construction was shut down as well, we actually advised departments to bring forward all of the necessary preparatory work so that construction contracts could be awarded right away as soon as construction was able to start working again. Uh, so I mean, we, all of our efforts have been bent in terms of trying to make sure both at an executive level and, and in our department to make sure that we can get capital spend done, that, that we recognise its importance to economic growth and, and sustaining jobs. Uh, uh, and so there, there's never any approach to this in terms of trying to, to downgrade capital spend or try and raid capital budgets. Uh, it's just that there are always a difficulty in year in terms of getting things spent for a variety of different reasons, which aren't necessarily to do with the construction side itself, but it's often in terms of the, the approaches, the planning issues, the you know, regulations around this, you know, uh, a whole range of issues can intervene. Uh, in relation to, I think you were asking about the EU funding and the, the, the lack of the impl implementation of uh, the um of the internal market bill. Yes, the internal market bill. That's yeah, and that the, the implication for us is in relation to EU funding because I said we have continued on uh, outside of the kind of negotiations that are on the peace plus, which is the peace funding plus the interreg uh, funding that had been there, and that will continue on. At the moment, there's about 650 million euros in that. Uh, and we're working through the programmes in relation with, obviously, with the Southern Government and in relation with Europe and uh, in relation with London as well. Uh, and 
we would hope that there is a possibility of an increased contribution that that's yet to be worked through. I know that's a bit of dialogue <coughs> going on between London and Dublin at the moment. Uh, but all of the other EU funding, you know, the, the social funds and the Erasmus and all of that, the, the cap funding is a separate issue, although there's, there are concerns there as well. Uh, we were operating on the basis, as was promised by the British government, that any EU funding loss would be replaced like with like to devolved areas. Uh, and we would administer that. We would design the programmes for it. We have the knowledge on the ground as to what's needed uh, and where it's needed. The executive have our own priorities. Besides which, any money which is spent on areas like community <coughs> through the Department of Communities is a devolved responsibility. Any money that's spent on the local economy is a devolved responsibility. Spent on infrastructure locally is a devolved responsibility. So it shouldn't be the case that somebody sitting in Whitehall and de deciding which border road might benefit from you know, an upgrade. Uh, th those are things that we have our responsibility for here. That's part of devolution. That's part of the agreement for devolution. Uh, so the idea that the single uh, market bill would usurp all of that is something which is very, very concerning to us, something which we have repeatedly said to Treasury. We have not got an explanation as to why that approach has been taken. Obviously, that piece of legislation is still passing through. Uh, Westminster I had a conversation with the opposition. Or the, yeah, the Shadow Secretary of State the other day when we raised this issue as well uh, with her. Uh, and I know that Scotland and Wales have the same issue. So any time we've joined calls with Treasury, this is always raised. So we haven't any resolution to it yet. And we're flagging up the concern uh, that, you know, why take that degree of power if you had no intention of using it? Uh, and that's a direct challenge, not only to the promises were made in terms of replacement of EU funding, but also to the, the basis on which this administration was set up on Scotland and Wales. Thank you, Minister. And just finally, um, the, um, the Treasury, in relation to the NI protocol, uh, how confident are you that they'll step up to the plate there and deliver? Well, again, it's a commitment that was given that they would meet the costs. Uh, I'm not surprised. On two levels, one, they'll do their own due diligence to make sure the costs are what, what, what they should be. And we have had to gather those costs in because quite a lot of that work is done by the Agriculture Minister in terms of the ports. He's responsible for putting in place the regulations and the checks that are needed there. Uh, and there are other departments that have contributions. So we have had to gather the costs from them, sort of collate those do our own due diligence, I presume, in relation to them as well, as the Department do, and then send those on to Treasury, and they'll do that. Now, part of that may be caught up, as I was suggesting, Chair, in the negotiation, that they're not going to declare their hand on what they're going to spend on the protocol until they finalise the negotiation. But the sooner we know about that, the better, because there are costs in year in relation to that. Uh, and, but the, commit, the commitment has been given that they will meet, and they have reiterated that on a number of occasions to us, they will meet the costs. They just haven't said, OK, we accept that that is the cost and, and here's, here's the money for it. But sure, just, just to start with that, but surely because of the infrastructure that is already being committed to, and again, Michael Gove has already said through the Joint Committee is being done, yeah. we must already have seen contracts for drawdown of expenditure yeah. on the border control points of the, that are being put at the ports. We should have already seen that, shouldn't we? Yeah, because the, I mean, the Agriculture Minister is getting on with the work that he was obliged to do at the ports and putting checks in. And uh, uh, so, yes, that, that work has started. And, so the contracts uh, have already been let from agriculture to... Treasury gave us approval in principle to commence that work because of the timescales involved, subject to a business case, and that business case has now been submitted to them for sort of final approval and agreement of the funding. But they did give us agreement to commence the work. So the business case is already through, so they're already spending the money to start. They're spending the money. Treasury have yet to come back and formally approve the business case, but they did allow us to start in advance of that because they recognise the time scales involved. And that's already started. And that's so true. agriculture has already done what it's supposed to have done. Graham Elgott, Minister, thank you very much for the briefing. It's been very useful. And I have a couple of points and questions to ask, but just following on from uh, Malicia's question with regard to the internal market bill, I mean, it's clear from your answers that you have concerns about <coughs> the impact of the bill on uh, replacement EU funding for the North and, and, the, and the impact that it may have with regard to devolution and uh, usurping some of the powers that the Assembly would have. Have you any concerns with regard to the ability of the executive? Uh, with state aid principles? Um, I, that, <laughs> uh, somebody would say that's probably an ecumenical question, but uh, it, it probably go on, is. Go on, go on. It, it yeah. probably uh, depends on the negotiation outcome as well. Uh, 
I'm not certain, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, uh, I mean, our, our priority has been to secure replacement okay. and secure authority over allocation. I, I think, as the minister says, there are potential implications, but it depends on, on the differences between the, the state aid regimes as well. So, so it might be a wait and see. Fair enough. If you had Bill Pauly here, he'd be able to tell you that in great detail. Fair enough. Okay. Well, let me. me, me, me move sorry, just, uh, just for, sorry for cutting across. You said an interesting thing there about state aid issues and concerns about whether it would come under state aid rules. Did I just pick you up wrong well, on Sorry, that? I, I was resp responding to the question which raised state aid. So, yes, the internal bar markets bill, there are potential implications, as opposed for Peace Plus and, and any difference between the sort of British and Irish state aid regimes might cause friction. But as the Minister said, it's not my area of speciality. So, If you wish, we could, we could uh, have yeah, Bill Pauly uh, send up a briefing into the committee in relation uh, to that. Obviously, the significant issue around about state aid and one of the issues that we haven't bottomed out yet, either through the special committee to the joint committee and the various other sort of streams to it as well. But the issue, and I think Philip has t touched on something, is quite important because, particularly when we're looking at how this is looked at after the 1st of January next year, that a lot of these issues that previously would have been used as part of EU special funding and the rest of it may indeed now be deemed as state aid. And that will have significant implications on how we do it and how we sort of manage, manage the process. But I think the committee would like to see that, if, that's, if you can make yep. that commitment. Yeah, we can arrange for that to be sent up. Yeah, but sorry, sorry, Philip, for cutting okay. across there. It was just a... uh, I mean, I mean, we've covered some very important uh, topics today. I mean, there's, there's a lot of big issues, whether it's Brexit, uh, budget. I mean, and obviously, it is a disappointment that we're now not getting the, the multi-year budget that we were promised. I think, as you said, that, that, that is going to be very useful, and hopefully this is the last year. Uh, but I mean, the big issue is COVID. And uh, I mean, I just when you're here, I want to congratulate uh, yourself and your department for uh, the initiative that, that you have shown with regard to getting funding out very, very quickly. I mean, I, I represent a constituency heavily reliant on hospitality and tourism, which is obviously deeply affected by uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic and, and, and more latterly by restrictions. But it has been welcome that the majority of those businesses have now been able to at, at least apply and will get funding to hopefully see them through. Uh, I mean, there is the issue of employees, and I, mean, I, I welcome your support in terms of uh, trying to get some more certainty from uh, the British Treasury with regard to that. That's a big issue. But I mean, I, as an MLA, the big issue facing, I suppose, this committee and us individually is COVID and supporting businesses, employees, and you know, whilst. Last week, I was getting calls from the tourism and hospitality sector. That, those calls have now diminished because there is a, an element of certainty there. You know, but there are a, an awful amount of calls still coming in from uh, businesses and individuals, employees, self-employed, who missed out the first time, who are unsure of whether they're going to miss out this time. And it is disappointing that other departments haven't shown the same initiative and a speed of resolution that the Department of Finances have. I mean, have you any kind of time frame for when other departments will come forward, and have you any kind of certainty of the the range of businesses and individuals that will be able to benefit from other schemes? Because I mean, that that's the major concern out there. Well, the, uh, I, I, I should have said when the chair asked the question earlier about the kind of overall pot we have left. The, the scheme that we have brought forward is about taking about 35 million out of that. Uh, so it reduces down, and then we expect, in terms of the immediate response to this, uh, I have a conversation with the economy minister about the, the particularly in the close contact services, uh, we, any of them that have a premises, you know, a barbers or hairdressers salon or a beauty parlour or whatever else they happen to be, uh, will be able to attract support on the basis of that premises and the rateable value of that premises. But of course, quite a lot of them don't. Uh, they either operate from home or at a shed out the back or uh, kind of hire a chair in, a, in, a, in some establishment and, and just operate from that. So we have asked, uh, I have asked the Economy Minister to prioritise finding those people first and trying to get a level of support out to them. We have, as you know, reserved £55 million in a pot for the people who have not yet received any support. Uh, and, and I'm hoping, uh, I know it's at least at least a month since the arrangement was agreed for the Department of Infrastructure to pick that up. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping something was forward in relation to taxis, coaches. Coaches are particularly difficult. In anybody who's you know 
constituency is an interest in the tourism business will know that coaches are vital to the tourism business and, and they are under very severe pressure and have been because they've effectively been shut down since March and haven't been able to to, to reactivate their businesses where other sides of tourism and hospitality have. Uh, so there are particular pressures there. So I'm hoping that those schemes will come forward uh, very quickly. There are other areas uh, like the self-employed uh, travel agents uh, have been making a case for support as well. Uh, and I know we're due to hear from them in the near future uh, as well as really in relation to that. And I know that the economy minister said that she wants to look at issues around supply side to tourism and hospitality, people who aren't obliged under the regulations to close their business but will suffer very substantial economic damage because of the closure of another sector, because uh, none of these things are, exist in silos or are not going to affect for other businesses. So, uh, you know, the sooner the, the, the schemes to pick up the people who have been missed come through, the better, and the sooner the schemes to deal with the immediate issues that we're dealing with in terms of this intervention over these four weeks, then the better for us. And then I think, broadly speaking, the economy generally needs support, and we have to find ways. Uh, the conversations with people in retail just before I come into this meeting about support for the high street, making the shopping experience safer for people going out. <coughs> That's been done in other countries where people feel a bit more comfortable with going out, because, uh, of course, we want people to. Uh, adhere to the regulations and social distancing and face coverings and uh, hand sanitisation and all of that. But we also want people, particularly the retail in this season coming up, to be able, uh, you know, comfortable about going out shopping and, and going out uh, creating footfall in the high street. So, uh, are there things we can do in town centres to, you know, support that to make it more, uh, you know, cleaner, safer? environment for people to go out shopping in. So there are a range of initiatives and, uh, that the executive across the various departments can do, and the money that we have to spend has to be done by the end of the financial year. So the sooner those initiatives come through to us, then the better. Just, just briefly, uh, through you, Chair, there's a pot of £55 million for people who, who haven't been able to benefit uh, so far, and there's a pot obviously now being uh, taken money from for the current uh, uh, Whatever you want to call it, circuit breaker, lockdown, or, or restrictions. Uh, I mean, is there money then, or how much money then uh, is there, or will be available, perhaps from Christmas to the end of the financial year? Sh should uh, further interventions be needed? Well, I mean, we have to see what comes forward first in terms of the, uh, and also in that pot, uh, I think we had also held money back for the airports because uh, there's a further intervention needed in, in support uh, costs for the three airports as well. Uh, so, I mean, it, it looks like a large pot, but there's, there's quite a lot of calls on it uh, already. Uh, and then I think we'd, it would be prudent for us. I mean, the, the executive, I think, want to, over this four-week period, try and ensure that we don't have to get into a situation where further interventions are required. So, if we can get uh, much more improved track and trace and isolation, if we can get the message better, if we can get collaboration back to that level of collaboration through perhaps the Department of Communities with local community and voluntary groups and the councils in terms of getting the message out there, then all of those things should be done over the next four weeks so that when this intervention comes to an end, we, we aren't you know, necessarily looking at, well, this will last us for a period of time and we need another intervention. So that's the last thing that we want to see. But I think it is some prudence in, in keeping money back to see how things pan out over Christmas, but then it would have to be quickly spent. Uh, yeah. in, the, in the new year and the, the end of the financial year. So, yes, it, it, now that's the executive's call. I mean, I, I make recommendations to the executive. It's their call as to how the money is spent. Uh, but I, I would be thinking it would be prudent to hold back something to see, because this is very uncertain times, and Brexit's a very uncertain time, and that's kicking in on the 31st of December <coughs> as well, uh, to, to hold back something to see what we may need, uh, some emergency interventions in the new year. But the clear intention of the executive is not, in terms of COVID response, to get back into that type of scenario, because I think that increasingly just makes economic activity unsustainable. Uh, and so we don't want to have to get back there. But uh, there will be an argument, and I, I certainly would be advocating that we, given the big uncertainty beyond Christmas, that we do hold something back to see what emergency support might be needed. Thanks. Sorry, just for clarification, it wasn't in case there's another uh, intervention. It was more from a point of view of a financial stimulation. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Pat, just sure. a short This was just a small point on the back of uh, my colleague, Mr. Fallick, when I remember Mr. McMahon asking, uh, Minister, and it's to do with um, just that you, you were taking that broader p picture there of close contact. I'm looking at people who are within a hairdressing shop that don't own the premises but rent out the chair. I know that you'll be familiar with them. I, like everyone else, I'm sure I'm getting the same questions. 
and I would ask you to look at them as a special, like for beauticians, they can't get the help uh, coming through because they don't own the business, but there may well be 10 of them self-employed uh, working and holding that, holding that chair. There is a, they feel like they don't have the help and it took a long time for that to come out to them. And that was a small point. I hope you didn't mind, and I want to thank you for bringing me in on that, Chair, okay. and Mr McGuigan for bringing it up as well. Well, as I say, I've had this conversation with the Economy Minister because we, with, in the Finance Department, can only do something which has a premises attached to it, mm-hmm. yes. uh, and we can do it through the rate system then. Uh, but there clearly are people in that sector that work uh, either through hiring out chairs or just travel and go to people's houses to cut their hair or to do makeup or whatever else they do, and they won't have a premises, they won't have a rates ID number attached to them. So uh, it, the, 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 I suppose the challenge is identifying those people, verifying that they're in that business uh, and, and trying to get some level of support to them. And I've asked that that be a priority in terms of the economy's respo- uh, response. Thanks, Chair. Okay, sir. Jim? Sorry, Jim Elster. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to probe a bit the issue of... Um, this idea of transferring from capital to resource. Um, no doubt someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of fiscal theory at a national level always was that you funded your resource out of taxation and you funded your capital where you needed it out of borrowing. Now, if that is correct and we are given the power to transfer from capital which is borrowed money, is it not likely, and indeed was this not always the reason why there was this prohibition on the transfer, is it not likely that Treasury will say, well, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to pay the interest on the borrowings? We've already been through that with the exit scheme. We've had to pay the interest. We're already going through that with our RRI. Is the same theory not likely to be applied to moving money from capital to resource? Well, there already is. Uh, I mean, it's not a hard and fast principle because there already is a, a small figure, a small allowance in terms of transfer of capital yes. uh, to, to resources. So, uh, what we're seeking is more flexibility in that. And uh, of course, that might challenge in terms of what how Treasury approach these issues, but. I would argue that our overall spend in terms of the British government's overall spend is, is a very limited one. It's not for a wholesale transfer because I mean, the executive's view and, and our view in the finance is that capital spend is, is valuable spend which can stimulate further economic activity and growth and sustain jobs uh, and obviously then lead to improvement in inf- infrastructure. Uh, so it's not that there's a whole scale desire to transfer huge chunks of capital across the resource, but when you do get to the end of a financial year, it's the most difficult money to spend out. Uh, and so it is about uh, there is a flexibility there currently. It's about an extension of that flexibility, not in a, in a vast scale, but in a in, in a in a moderate scale. Is there not a second danger that Treasury may say to you when you say we need to trans- we, we want to transfer money from capital to resource? If you ever have the occasion to go to Treasury and say, well, we need more resource money, would they simply say back to you, then take it out of your capital? Does it not weaken your case for looking for more I mean, resource money? Joanne would have much more engagement with Treasury than me. I, I don't think so. I think Treasury, because certainly uh, in uh, conversations I've had with them both individually as a finance minister, but also collectively with the other finance ministers, this is an issue that we've all collectively raised. Uh, and so they have never come back and said they have said that they are prepared to look at the issue of flexibility. Uh, they haven't given us any hard and fast in terms of what that might mean, and that's what we've been pressing them on. So they have never come back and said, "Well, you know, if you need more resources transferred from your capital," because I think they also understand this isn't about trying to change capital spend. This is about trying to manage finances at the end of the financial year. That would be the case. Yeah, I mean, that would be the case, and I think you're absolutely right that any capital borrowing, no matter who it's done by, scores against public sector net debt, and Treasury would be interested yeah. in keeping that as low as possible. I think also this year with the COVID, those rules may have gone out the window, even for Treasury themselves, where they're borrowing to fund resource spend. Yeah. Um, interestingly, when the executive wasn't in place and the Secretary of State was setting our budget, that was one of the. the things that they put in place to balance off the resource budget was a capital to resource switch. Yeah. 
at that time, but that's not the purpose we're looking for it for. We just want that flexibility to help us if there is slippage in capital programmes which cannot be used for worthwhile projects to have the ability. And we're not looking for an unlimited amount, we're looking for a small amount to give us additional flexibility. Well, do we know what amount? No, that would be subject, I suppose, to negotiations with Treasury, what See, would be is, an acceptable would level, not, probably for a proportion. An alternative option would be to focus on maximising end-of-year flexibilities. We're seeking that as, an, as a flexibility as well. That, that one may actually be more worthwhile if we could have that. Yeah. It, yeah. it used to be many years ago. There's exactly. likely to be less strings enough. attached to that, aren't there? Yeah. Well, there are two areas. One is the flexibility to change. Uh, yeah. And then there's flexibility to carry over. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah, I mean. Carry over. We're pressed on yeah. we're pressed on both issues, yeah. uh, and, and just trying to get. And it is it's not about trying to change the the nature of our budget or change the nature of our spend. It's about trying to manage the spend at the end of the financial year. Sorry, Jim, just a comment. Joanne, you said previously the Secretary of State utilised that yes. facility. What percentage was he looking at? We didn't look at a percentage. I think from memory, and I'd need to clarify it, but I think it was $100 million actually in, in one of the budget steps. Is that State where the 0.6 transfer. comes from? No, the, the 0.6 is simply a percentage for carry forward. That was an amount of capital that was switched into resource to balance off the budget. The 0.6 is our budget exchange scheme limit, which is carry forward from one year to the next in resource, and then there's a percentage did he do, of capital. Did they use, was it a maximum of $100 million each year for the three years? No, it was only it was for a one-year budget, and it was $100 million from memory. I need to go back and double check. My memory is not what it used to be, but it was $100 million in one year. Was transferred from capital to. Could you just send us a note to that to the committee yeah. so we're aware of that because that will help inform our discussions. So if it's already been put in place, maybe that's something we need to we need to see. I don't think it was. It was, it was for one year only, yeah. and it was just for that particular budget. It wasn't. It wasn't a flexibility that was ongoing. But yeah. I can certainly check Somebody that. Somebody the treasury yeah. said yes, so at least that's a start. Sorry, Jim. Sorry. I, I just, just one totally different point on the um, black box issue. Could I make a suggestion to the department that in the estimate document that they expand on the note to indicate why in each case there is reliance on the budget only because it, I think it would go some way to transparency in that not that it takes away from the fact that there should be legislative authority for all that spend but where there isn't I think we're entitled to know with more clarity in the estimates why it's been black boxed. Uh, yep. I, I don't have an issue that. with that. Uh, as, as I said, and I, I think I explained again on yesterday in the in the chamber, I had spoken to yourself about it on on Monday. We want to ensure there's a consistency in terms of that approval. Uh, those figures do go into the estimate, so they are given that kind of democratic authority from the the, the chamber. But I think you're right. The more transparency, so people reading the documents can understand them. Uh, I think. You know, it's the whole financial review process, which is is intended to make the budgets and the the uh, voting and account and all of those documents as accessible as possible, mm. uh, is is underway. And, and and I'm hoping to see improvements that in, in the in the years ahead because I, I I agree with you that they are, you know, these are complex documents and the, the more transparent that we can make them in, the better in terms of the scrutiny that. Is, is the job of this committee and of the, the Assembly generally, but also for the public to understand spending, how it's done and why it's done. Because I think the question you asked in relation was the welfare mitigation, and mm. there was a very clear and logical explanation for it. But had that been included in the document, then I think that might have been a better way Thank to do it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Jim. Thanks, Sir. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Thanks both for coming. Um, on um, what you've just been discussing. Uh, Capital on the flexibilities have been asked for from Treasury. Can I be clear that are those permanent flexibilities going forward, or just for this financial year? No, I think it's it's I think it's the principle of that going forward that we want to establish. That as I say, it's not it's not about a whole scale alteration of, of the, the the finances that we have. Yeah. I think all of the devolved areas, particularly in in, a, in an annual budget situation, I think it's more acute. Yeah. But even in a multi-annual budget situation, where we're finding that you you end up spending out at the end of the financial year because the imperative everybody knows that the imperative is the biggest kick in all the departments will get is if they have handed money back and it's gone back to treasury. Uh, so the imperative is to spend the money. That doesn't mean it's necessarily spent on what should be the priority at any given time. Uh, and, and so that the argument is to try and get some degree of flexibility, both in terms of conversion 
uh, but also end of year flexibility that we can carry over more. It's not, as I say, to to vastly increase that. It's not about changing the, the nature of spend. It's about it's about making sure that we can uh, we can spend it as closely aligned to the priorities we had as, as we possibly can, rather than simply spending it to, to make sure it's not handed back. Is there a? I, I, I know we, we sort of discussed this um, in debate, but I th the current budget exchange stream is 0 0.6 R um, resource, and I think it's 1.5 capital and 0 0.6 in Ardell um, carry forward. Is there a specific? New, is, have you asked for a specific percentage increase on those thresholds? No, we haven't. We haven't put a specific figure to them. We're looking at an increase in flexibility. We've talked around it. The, the other administrations haven't put a specific figure either. Uh, but I think what we're trying to do is establish the principle. Uh, it hasn't been rejected in terms of any of the discussions we've had with them. We just have never uh, bottomed it out. And I think then it, it may be the case, you know, that. Uh, Joanne could advise. I'm not sure that you, from year to year might be different experiences. We might just want the principle yeah. of a degree of flexibility within, within, if you like, a band. Uh, so we, we can see because there's some years if things go according to plan, we won't need any flexibility at all. Uh, you want to force the door ajar and then walk in after it. Yeah. Um, uh, on, just in terms of what's outstanding, unallocated. We know about the 600 million headroom in health, and some of that might come back depending on what happens in the next few months and other pressures. What is the outstanding, aside from that, what's the outstanding unallocated Ardell at the minute? There's the 55.2, and then we're going into the monitoring round, which may change that. But before yeah. that, we've got the 200 million we got last week from the, or the 9th of October from the Treasury. Of that, 35 million has gone to the DOF scheme that has been put in place. So that leaves 165, and then there's whatever comes out of the monitoring round so or whatever health managed. 165 million plus whatever comes out of monitoring, yeah. basically, whatever departments hand yeah, back. Yeah, in including need. health assessment of the 600 million. And of that, one, so it's 165 plus whatever comes out of monitoring. Plus, plus 55, which is being held for other sectors. Uh, oh, so the, 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 the 55 held for the excluded is not, is not, not included of, in the 165? No, it's additional. No. So if we, and is, is it your view, and, and then that. 165. So it doesn't include the 55, nor does it include whatever comes back from the 600 from That's health. Right, yeah. Is that, is it the view that that 165? Have you taken a view that that 165 will have to primarily go on COVID-related mitigation, given that the principle is we're trying to get Brexit-related mitigation from Treasury? Well, it, it's kind of a. There's almost Chinese walls between these things now. It's kind of a juggling exercise because yeah. in the middle, if, if we weren't dealing with COVID at all, if this was a normal year, we'd just be dealing with monitoring round yeah. and what's coming back and then trying to reallocate it. Depart departments would obviously bid, surrender, and then bid in in terms of, of, of priorities and pressures that they have and, and the, the department trying to make an assessment and make a recommendation to the executive. In the middle of all of that, we're trying to juggle the COVID money. Yeah. So the, the, there's a possibility of if, if it comes a bigger priority in terms of COVID response, that monitoring around money goes to that and some of the pressures that departments may be experiencing are, are quite likely COVID related as well. Yeah. So th there's no there's no clear separation between the two, to be quite honest. It's, it's almost like a Chinese wall situation that they, you know there 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 will possibly be overlap between the two. Now, the two exercises are, are trying to be kept yeah. separate because one is the surrender and the other one is an allocation of money that we're trying to distribute. But uh, there may well be overlaps in, in between them. And on the question of um to, uh, on financial transactions capital, I think there's 70 million unallocated on FTC. The, of the 100 million, I think 30 of it is going to University of Ulster. The other 70 is as yet unallocated. When I asked the department last week, there was a. It was clear that, that was part of the flexibility was being asked for from Treasury. Is there? Are you trying to? Are you thinking about either turning that into conventional capital? That would be obviously quite a novel thing. Or is work going on to try and design a scheme where you use? FTC, the FTC allocation to, for example, uh, fund businesses, uh, a kind of, it, it, to, to, for example, create a kind of business restart fund that can be allocated as FTC. Is there work, is work going on on that? Well, I think in the first question, Joanne, can give me right. I don't think it's possible to transfer possible. FTC into yeah. conventional. And it's a different capital. type of spending. Okay. I get yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, I think then, what in the absence of that and the desire across the board, not just in the executive, but clearly in the assembly. This has been raised many times to make sure that it is utilised. And we've been pressing departments to come up with innovative ways to try yeah. and utilise that money. So if somebody comes forward with a proposition which, which can utilise I know the 
housing designation issue is, is we hope, coming to a head fairly yes. soon. Now, whether that is early enough to allow them to, to, to avail of FTC in the remainder of the financial year uh, is, is going to be a matter for the Department of Communities. But uh, we have been encouraging departments to come and spend that, because understandably there has been criticism that that is you know, at a time when we have very limited resources, that is a resource available to us and has not been fully utilised. So we will encourage, if there are schemes to come forward in terms of, of economic interventions and it can avail of FTC, then we are certainly happy to look at those. But we can't do that conversion into conventional capital as a from it. Is it something? Do you think? Of the, if the, is it something the Northern Ireland Tourist Board should be looking at? Is it, are they? Is it too novel and too ambitious for them to try and design a? And now, FTC is not got spending. It's financing. It is classified in a different way by the ONS, and that's obviously constrained how it's been spent. And public sector bodies here are just not as used to dealing with financial transactions as they maybe are in England. But is that would you if, would you use the opportunity now to say to not that I'm putting you on the spot, but for example, the tourist board to come up with novel ways of thinking about how it's spent or financed. If, I mean, as I say, our encouragement in general terms has been to, to people to go around to. I think Joanne will know better from over the years experience, but I think it it's probably has been a degree of additional burden on trying to find ways to spend FTC. So if departments are concerned about not having cash back at the end of the year, they're focusing on spending the cash they've been allocated, not searching for new ways to avail of other resources. So, but it's, it's a resource that we haven't properly utilised, and so. The department has been encouraging people to come up with ways of doing that. So we're kind of pressing departments, and we can't force them to do it, but we're pressing departments to come up with it. I'm sure that's part of the rationale why we haven't. Yeah, I mean, I think it also it's departments stepping outside their comfort zone because this is, yeah. is primarily for loans, and departments yeah. aren't used to managing those loans. But um, in some instances, there is a preference from the recipients. Obviously, would prefer a grant rather than a repayable loan. So there's that issue as well. There is the departments don't have the expertise in managing those loans, and we're actually working with the SIB at the moment right, yeah. to try and come up with ways to support departments to do that. In the very short term. It, in the short and the longer term, you so know, the, we the kicked that work off pre-COVID, and we'll continue to, to do that to try and encourage them. But is there a is there a specific ask to the SIB to try and think of ways to spend this 70 million in the next few months? Well, it not wouldn't, in, it, just in a kind of Brewster's Millions way, yeah, but in a sort of like. It wouldn't be for the SIB to come up with ways <coughs> to spend it. That would be for the individual departments that have the policy right. responsibility. Um, SIB would come in in this sort of support role to help them around the, the mechanisms of managing loans and doing due diligence and that sort of thing. And on RR, RRI borrowing. Um, What's the likelihood of us using the headroom in the next? That is the, of the two hundred million in the next few months. But uh, it's another resource available to us. I, I think. It's, yeah, I mean, I'm not averse to looking at it. Uh, there's obviously a, a cost to using it, uh, but you know, perhaps from the, the early part of the conversation, we we have a not insubstantial amount of COVID money to spend out before the end of the financial year. Yeah. Uh, and we are have been focused, I suppose, for most of this year on emergency response mode. Yeah. Uh, RRI tends to be a bit more of a, a long-term process, and you know, uh, understanding how it's paid back by you know, as it, it's paid back managed centrally in terms of the payback of it. But uh, so, uh, you know, if if we get the headspace to to have to find ways to use it, then I, I'm, I'm certainly not averse to using it. My priority is to make sure that the the money, the cash we have in hand. Gets out onto the ground as quickly as we can and does as much support as we can. There are other areas, and we are encouraging people because it's not just FTC. There's the investment fund, mm -hmm. uh, there's the international fund for Ireland, yeah. uh, and we're trying to make sure that all of these things are utilised. Are, 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 we're, we're having conversations with the, the investment fund was really largely based in and around Belfast. Yeah. It didn't go out beyond that. So to make sure there's awareness of that, because if these things are all available to us then, and we can we can uh, you know. Try and shape them according to the executive's priorities. International funds, another one. Uh, obviously, Peace Plus is another one. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that these things aren't done in isolation. So, of course, RRI is, is available to us, but there's quite a lot in terms of trying to spend the money that we have at the moment. If I may, one last question there. Yeah, just uh, one. Yeah, chair. Um, on um, Brexit the protocol, um, you mentioned that sort of possible emergency interventions. We all hope there is a deal and the protocols made to work as seamlessly as possible. But it is part of the emergency intervention to mitigate um, additional costs in the event that it is particularly burdensome. 
in January? Is there, and is there a specific sum you have set aside for that? No, I think there, I mean, as, as well as part of the protocol implementation, that there was there was promises, as yeah. my understanding, from Treasury to assist cost to business yeah. as well uh, in terms of Brexit. So it's not as if we're holding back COVID money, saying there's going to be a Brexit cost here. I'm saying there's a whole lot of uncertainty. The, the, the cost of Brexit isn't just in terms of the cost of implementing the protocol mm. and whatever additional charges there may be to businesses to try and yeah. match whatever requirements there are, but there's a, an economic cost to it which yeah. is a kind of a general depressing uh, cost on, to, on, term, on top of the economy. So what I'm saying is in terms of being prudent and not knowing what the new year will throw up, I think it, it's, it's, it would be helpful to us to have some sum that we can use, if you like, for a kind of rainy day fund. That's my own view. The executive might disagree with that and say, spend it all now. Uh, but my own view is that it's not necessarily to meet the costs of Brexit in terms of the actual uh, cost of transactions or the cost of protocol. But in general terms, I think the economy is going to ship some damage uh, from a double whammy, if you like, of COVID and Brexit. And, and I think it would be prudent to have something to try and give assistance where it's needed at that time. Thank you. John, just a quick one before bringing bring in uh, the other, Jim. Um, you were talking about sort of housing and particularly changing the housing designation to enable them to be able to attract FTC and look at FTC as well. But the other area that needs a significant amount of investment is obviously water. But obviously, we have a rather strange legal setup within Northern Ireland Water that's a go co that isn't a go co. Somehow, I don't know how we ever managed to do that, but we've achieved that. That obviously is something that I wonder if the department is looking at, at how we could specifically look at that, because that is somewhere where we could be using a substantial spend, a long term programme that helped revitalise the Northern Ireland construction industry. But it's been based on the fact of the legal entity of, the, of, the, of Northern Ireland Water. Is there any views within the department about helping to transform Northern Ireland Water with its, its legal status? So, indeed, it could be borrowing a substantial chunk of this FTC. It's not the Northern Ireland Water's legal status that is the problem. It's the ONS classification, which puts it into the public sector, and that's related to water charges, basically. So, I think it's, it's primarily for the Department of Infrastructure to consider mm. that and come forward with proposals on how that can be addressed. But it's because it was within the public sector that it can't actually borrow without it impacting on our capital deal. Ironically, I think the last time a proposition was brought forward to look at that was when I was DRD Minister. It never got beyond executive discussion. Uh, there wasn't a, a big appetite to... It would have involved a very substantial amount of work to change the, the status of it. Uh, but it, part of the reason was that it couldn't attract investment uh, at that time. So, uh, But it would be for the Department of Infrastructure to bring forward. We did give as well as giving a significant capital budget to infrastructure in the budget in March, we did give an additional 15 million, I think, in the last allocation specifically for Northern Ireland Water yeah. for uh, wastewater and uh, uh, sewage and uh, that kind of schemes. I think it was about 11 schemes in total or something they had brought yeah. forward. The Northern Ireland Water's quantum is a d few decimal points beyond that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Jim? Right, some very interesting stuff here. Um, just, just a couple of questions. First of all, Whilst you have been able to bring us the uh, monitoring round figures for reasons which you've explained, Kevin, can you give us a, a, an insight into whether you expect a large amount of money to be forthcoming to meet the pressures that are ongoing in so many departments? Or would you have to well, Joanne, Joanne has more detail on that. <laughs> you have to right. strangle me if you told uh, me that. Uh, what, 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 uh, before maybe Joanne can come in with some more of the detail, what, what does concern me is, uh, given the year we've had and, and the fact that departments would not have been able to spend certain things that they had planned and got budget allocations for, I would have almost anticipated more return uh, in the monitoring round for reallocation. And it hasn't been, in general terms, that out of the ordinary. Uh, and I, I'm sincerely hoping uh, that, that departments aren't waiting until January to be sure that they're not going to spend money, because I think that puts an added pressure on us to try and, and spend that money out. So that, that's my own kind of overarching view. But in terms of yeah. the no, figures and, and, and what's, what's just come back? I, I don't have the actual figures in front of me, but it's, it's not, well, it depends on your definition of large, but it's not a huge amount. It, it, you know, it's in the sort of tens, twenties of millions, as opposed to you know, higher uh, levels. Joanne, I'm confident if you don't have them before you, you have them in your head, as you have all <laughs> these figures. Um, the other, the other issue, very interested in what you were saying about the uh, form of funding for, for businesses that have been forced to close. Very welcome news on the B&Bs. But just, I didn't, when, when Paul and several others were asking the questions, this, I wasn't quite certain what you were saying. Are they going to be funded on the basis 
of the present lockdown, for the sake of argument, though it's not a lockdown, the present restrictions, are you going to go back to fund them as if they had been uh, funded from, say, the 20th of March? This is the B and B Yes, or? yeah. No, the the the, the schemes we have put in place to assist businesses now is for this four week period. Uh, in the conversation just prior to us bringing it in, we had a conversation with people who were previously excluded, included representatives of that small B and B sector, uh, and they were making the point that we should have and could have been captured for previous schemes, the, the 10k, the 25k schemes. We should have been captured there, uh, and, and said we could have been easily verified. Because they weren't on the on the non-domestic rate space, they were on the domestic rate space. Said we could have been verified through NI uh, or to Northern Board. Tourism Board, mm -hmm. uh, and so we taken that advice, checked that, and we were able to include them for this scheme. It doesn't address the fact that they missed out before, uh, and I think then that there uh, they, they, they would need to be continued to be a look at to see how those who missed out previously are. But that's one area that we were able to actually include in this in this scheme. Will they be treated more generously because they missed out on the previous scheme? I, I, don't, I think because this, this committee will have passed the regulations to decide on the basis of a uh, rateable value, this is what you're entitled to, the three bonds that you would have agreed as part of the regulations. So I don't think we can, we can pick that sector. I, I think, uh, I, I'm not saying that they would be content with the money they get, but they, they're certainly content now to be in, involved in the scheme. But I, I don't think... Uh, I would be saying to them, uh, and there would be a responsibility of the Department of the Economy, uh, but I would be saying to them, well, you've got that now, so it doesn't matter that you didn't get before. I still think they are, should be considered one of the excluded groups and, and some support to recognise the, the, the damage they, they shipped in the early part of the lockdown, then, then it should be recognised. Yeah. But at least the B&B &B folk had a window of opportunity in July, August and September to have some trade, albeit very disrupted. The coach operators mm -hmm. have had nothing. I mean, I... I have three companies in South Down, and they've got new vehicles which haven't turned a wheel since March the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Paying, I mean, a, a good coach will cost you anything between two and three hundred thousand pounds. It's extraordinary mm -hmm. the cost of these vehicles, and of course they're they're now having to pay the um, leasing charges or the, the repayments. Again, the same question: any any uh, support that uh, you or the Department of the Economy are able to give them? Will it take account of the fact that for seven months they've had absolutely nothing? Well, I mean, I, I agree with you in terms of the damage that they have. They, they're an integral part. They, they're a, a part of public transport, but I think more so they're a part of the tourism uh, industry here. And I think there should have been a way of found to pick them up. Uh, I think they are a sector where, even where other sectors, all sectors suffered from the, the lockdown phase that we were in earlier on this year, they have never really been able to emerge from that. Uh, and I think they are in dire straits. And we, we have had them in the department. I know Sue Gray has met with them, and I called in to see them at the time. And I know there has been ongoing engagement with them. Uh, so, I mean, the sooner, uh, my understanding is now that infrastructure have agreed to pick up uh, some scheme in relation to them. So I don't know how that's been worked out. There are not a large number of them, as you, you will know, but their costs are very substantial. So we have, as I say, part of that 55 million pot set aside money to try and capture. Uh, some of these businesses. Uh, I don't know, I have no idea uh, what the cost might right. be if somebody was devising a scheme for them, but I just think the sooner we get a scheme devised for them, then the better, because I think they are in, in really serious financial difficulties, a lot of those coach operators. And if we want the tourism industry to pick up, hopefully again next year, then they're going to be a vital cog in that, uh, getting people out and about and to various attractions and, uh, uh, and all of that, that input that they have. Just to give you one shocking statistic, there are 121 cruise liners booked to call into Belfast this year. Mm -hmm. One out of 121 made it. And one of the companies I'm dealing with specialises in taking them to the Giants Causeway or to mm -hmm. or whatever. That's how dire the situation is. So we'll watch with good interest to see what can be done for them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Gemma? I'm actually okay now. Um, my question was on the coaches as well, so thanks very much. Okay. 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 Well, just a few final bits and pieces, Minister. Sorry. Sorry, I, I had indicated. I, I know you'd let me in earlier, Chair, but that was just a small Oh, you just a little one? No, you've got a bigger one now, have you, Pat? No, no, okay. No. My, my, my okay. is very small, believe me. And I want to thank the Minister for you know, making himself always available for, for, for where we are. Minister, back in September, provided the committee with a planned timetable for the budget. I understand that these circumstances are all outside of your control. Due to the absence of a UK budget, this timetable is no longer valid, so we don't have it. I know at the start our chair asked the question 
uh, when will you be bringing forward the budget for 21-22? And I just want to try and recap on this because I suppose one of the first times 10 months we got to speak was about the multi-year budgets, and I know you've already aligned that, and it's outside of your control that, that you're there. But if we are really serious you know, of where we want to do and how we're going to plan, we need to find some way of breaking this cycle. And I'm wondering, does your department have some way planned in order to try and break the cycle? And Minister, I do agree with you. Our tourism and hospitality sector is second to none. And it comes down to where we're from and the people where we come from here, from out there, the just general public, how welcome they are to tourists. And if we want to grow our economy, we need to have ourselves fit for purpose when this does lift. And it will lift, Minister. You know and uh, myself knows that it will lift. And I know the good work that will be done. And they'll be ready and they'll be hungry and they'll be keener than ever. And we'll get those those tours will come back, Mr Wells. We will get them back. But will the cruise the companies ships. be there to pick them up? That's right. Well let's hope they are there. And it's we're welcome in that fifty five million pounds which is sitting there for it as well. Well, I think the, I think the tourists will come back. It's ensuring that we have a coach industry to take them to all the attractions that yeah. we need to take them to. Otherwise, they'll be wandering around the docks in Belfast, uh, and that's that's not going to be of benefit. Uh, but it, it's not a question of uh, the budget timetable for us is really fixed. We know when we have to bring the legislation. The question is how much consultation can we do? How much information can we put out there? How much engagement can we do with committees uh, and yourselves, with the other committees, as you, as you do as part of the budget exercise uh, and that public consultation? So. The, the later we get an announcement in terms of the, the quantum that we have, we now know the time frame, which is disappointing, but we know the time frame. But the later we get an announcement of the quantum, then the, the consultation exercise becomes compressed. We will have to be bringing legislation to just here. To, just to, that's the probably we expect, next. We expect next, from the end of November that we'll get the. Well, occasion, on occasions that's run into December. Uh, you know, so that's that's an indicative date. Uh, if it runs into December, your level of consultation, you know, in the latter half of December is is, is fairly null and void. We would need to be bringing legislation. We would, in normal circumstances, we'd hope to be bringing legislation early in the new year. But certainly by February, we want to be bringing legislation. But at that stage, almost the consultation part, now the, the legislation has to run its course, and that is a consultation exercise in itself because people can, can have their input into it. But, you know, you're fairly at the latter end of that. You're at the tinkering around the edges stage of it rather than full consultation. So it's not the, the date of the budget itself. It's the, it's the run-up to it that it gets compressed. And, and we don't get the input that we would like to have, that this institution is a democratic institution or that the general public would, would like to have in terms of an input to it. So the earlier we have certainty in around the amount, that means the earlier we can go out. We're already beginning the engagement with the departments to say, you know, what are the pressures, what are the priorities? Uh, so we have a, a degree of work done in anticipation Minister, of it. Would you be hopeful uh, for an eight, eight weeks consultation period on that? Well, you know, that I think that's about the minimum. But it's not ideal if that covers part of the Christmas holidays as well. You know, it's not, and, and people do feel almost as if it's, it's kind of sleight of hand that they're being shortchanged in some way that we've run this over Christmas so that nobody can, you know, people aren't paying attention to it. I mean, if we were getting this announcement now. We would begin the consultation very, very quickly, and, and, and get the public consultation going. But that's that's the difficulty. Thank you, Thank, Connor. Thanks very much indeed. Just three very short ones. Yep. Um, first one: uh, October monitoring. I think you said that you're expecting it next week. You'll be in a position. Yeah, hopeful for next we'll week. We'll be making a. Connor, will you be making a statement? Yeah, I think we normally do on monitoring rounds. So if we are, I'll, I'll be in touch with yourself and deputy chair before that. To well, we're not have a conversation. We're obviously, we're not in sitting next week. So oh, is there no sitting next week? No, no. Yeah. Oh. Right. Halloween. We're going to yeah. frighten people. Well, we usually an extended Halloween break yeah. as well. It might depend when it gets to the executive. If it was on the Thursday, the statement yeah. would be on the Monday, the second, when you would be back. But yeah, it 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 has to go to the executive first, obviously, for approval. So if 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 it. Is it going to the executive this Thursday, is it? Yes, there is an executive this Thursday, so I am not certain. Yeah, no, would... That would be tomorrow. It is not going tomorrow. It oh. would be the following week. So then, yeah, right. the statement would be Monday the 2nd or Tuesday yeah, the 3rd, so right. we will be able to... to... Okay. Uh, okay, thanks for that. Uh, second one is, you have mentioned a couple of times questions, and there has been quite a few questions raised in the Assembly about the procurement board, yep. setting up the procurement board. And obviously, I think we would welcome the idea of a procurement board, but actually having a procurement board before we get the Fiscal Council up and running, where are we with that? Well, they're all. 
probably in terms of propositions procurement boards further advanced, uh, because the procurement board exists. What we want to do is reconstitute it. Uh, I brought a paper to the executive last week, I think it was, and we've had significant feedback from departments, because all of the departments, if you like, had a stake in the procurement board. We, we, uh, the executive is the ultimate procurement policy making device. Uh, so there's an interest in that, and, and departments like health and some of the others have their own significant procurement functions as well. Uh, so it, it's uh, a significant exercise, but we did bring a paper. There's been a fair degree of feedback, uh, very useful feedback from departments in relation to it. And I think we, what we want to do is amend the paper and bring it back to the executive. In relation to the Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Commission, uh, there is a paper coming through from officials, I think it was due through this week, to me to have a look at for some ideas in relation to it. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we did a meeting. On, I'm losing track of days because of all this that's going on, but I think it was on Monday morning we did a meeting with officials and we were told a paper would be with us this week. So I'm expecting uh, some ability to move that on fairly in the fairly near future. And if we could get that in front of the committee at some stage, because obviously yeah. the committee's got a lot of interest. It, it, it in was it. Uh, the fiscal council part of it, of course, was an NDNA commitment. It slipped like a lot of other commitments because of COVID response. But uh, I mean, we're, we're trying to get that back on track as quickly as possible. Yeah, we'd like to do that. And the final thing is, look, um, one of the things that I think has impressed the committee um, over the last couple of weeks has been the, the your de ability of your department to actually get on and start spending money and get it out there. Well, the one thing I have a degree of concern with, and I don't know if it's been echoed by the members of the committee here, but during my quick mass as Philip was busy sort of scribbling away, there's about £220 million that we need to get out to people who likely need to get it. And whereas I can see the finance department and some other departments are really pushing the envelope hard to get this money out there, there's a very there's a very little there's a relatively short period of time to get this money out to the people who need it. And any encouragement you can give, particularly to the Department of Economy and indeed the Department of Infrastructure, to get on with it is well beyond time, because it will not be long to, before we're in a situation where the money will not have been spent, and we're coming up to the end of the financial year, and time is running down rapidly. Well, I mean, we're very acutely aware of all of that. Uh, some of the some of the money we've held back that forms part of that pot that you've referred to uh, is reserved for those who have been previously not received support. and Obviously, then there are some schemes which have been brought forward to meet the immediate uh, issues in terms of this intervention. So, yes, absolutely, we are aware. There will be a question about are we keeping something back for the new year to see what shapes up. Uh, uh, and those are all questions that have to be resolved very quickly because we have that you know, four or five month time frame in which to spend this money. And, and from our perspective, in terms of economic interventions, what we're told very clearly is cash support, wage support. Wage support has to be done by London, uh, but we can do what we can do in terms of some cash support for businesses. And then there are various other interventions, like health, as you know, have signed off on their needs for the, for the rest of this financial year. But communities has a role as well, because we need council support, we need support going out on the ground of vulnerable people uh, and that. So we're encouraging all of the departments to quickly come in and let us know what they need so we can get that allocated as quickly as possible. Yeah, indeed. And what people don't need is more consultancy. They actually need some fiscal support, like money in their pockets. But, Connor, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very thank much you. indeed for your time. Please. Thank you, everybody. Right, Tim, if we move on to item number five, uh, let me see. Yeah, if you move on to item number five on the agenda, if I would uh, raise your attention to uh, Statute Rule 2020 221, Financial Assistance Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Clark's brief is on page 35. The Financial Assistance Regulations are on page 37. Letter from the Minister regarding the SRs on page 45 and response to the Committee's request for a written update and charges to the SR since it is considered at the SL1 stage is tabled at page 19, and the North West Financial Support announcements at page 46. Do we want to bring... Um... Yes, Terry's outside. Yeah, just bring you in. Ah. Welcome. <laughs> To make you a permanent member of this committee. Yes, I <laughs> hear that all. Back. Ian, welcome. Okay. Okay. Uh, the purpose of the proposed rule it will be to implement a scheme which the department is designated to enact. 
The scheme implemented by the proposed rule will provide financial assistance to businesses whose ability to trade is directly affected by the COVID-19 restrictions. The regulations are subject to the neg negative resolution procedure. The committee considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 7th of October, and although it was content with the policy proposals, the committee noted the SL1 was subject to change. A response to the committee's request for clarification for changes is tabled at page 19. Chair. At page 19. I'd like to draw the member's attention to the question raised by Pat regarding wet pubs that have only been permitted to open in late September, and the response from the Department at page 2, and the final paragraph which states the Minister has considered this point and agreed that such pubs should be exempt from the requirement that businesses must have opened after the last lockdown and been trading on the 1st of October in order to qualify for financial assistance. Pat, are you happy with that? I'm delighted. That would yeah. be welcome. Yeah. I would like to advise members that although the committee considered the SL1 on the 7th of October, the Department's publicity in the scheme states it came into effect on the 5th of October in Londonderry and the Strabane areas. Uh, Ian, you are obviously the official in attendance to answer any of the members the questions we have of this. Uh, the, stand, the statutory rule relates closely to the urgent SL1 table today, so we probably wish to consider both together uh, when, uh, when asking Ian some of the questions. Uh, team, Jim. Yes. Uh, you're not going to give a, an opening statement, no? Okay. Um, uh, maybe the committee would just like a run through what. Yeah, yes, please. Sorry. Um, so I was here on the 7th of October, as you said. Um, I did say that there would be some details subject to refinement, but um, I didn't anticipate some of the changes that would happen afterwards. So just to run through what happened. On the 9th of October, the UK government announced its three-tier restriction scheme for England, um, and the Chancellor announced on the same day a third-tier support for businesses in their scheme. Um, with uh, net annual values over £51,000, and that support would be in the region of about £3,000 per month. Um, so on the 12th of October, the, the Finance Minister put an update to the Executive where he proposed that this third tier payments would also be made available in Northern Ireland um, at around £800 per week, um, in addition to the two which had been in, uh, identified in the SL1. Um, previously, he also clarified some details on which businesses would be eligible. For example, um, closer scrutiny of the health regulations found that cinemas and several other businesses uh, would be required to, to close. Um, and there were some types of businesses, although not specifically mentioned in the regulations, uh, would not be able to run any activities. So we had um, a contact from a lady who runs a gym. Um, the gym was allowed to open, but her entire business was conducted in terms of things like aerobics classes and spin classes, and she, she was not permitted to, uh, to operate. Um, and then, uh, we also, as the letter said, um, reflected Mr Catney's request at the committee meeting. Um, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister determination and designation were received on the 12th of October. Um, the Executive agreed the updated details at its meeting of the 13th of October, and then the regulations were made on the 14th. Um, they came into force on the 16th. That's the date in which we were then able to make the um, payments from. But the scheme opened for applications before that. We opened it on the 12th. I think I had alluded that we would do that at the committee meeting on the 7th, after we got the FM and DFM's determination through. Um, we have received 462 applications on this scheme so far. Um, because of the fast-moving nature of events last week, some people who aren't eligible under the original scheme but are eligible under the new one applied through it. So uh, we will hold our applications and, and pay them. Um, a due course whenever the new regulations come into effect, and we have made 70 payments as of this morning. Okay, thanks. Yep. <clears throat> you, you did indeed consult us about this earlier, but <laughs> obviously now that the, the situation has been clarified, every MLA has been approached by people um, who have basically fought. I mean, the people who qualify have been told to close, accept it. Some may be a bit concerned about the level of payments, but they accept this clarity. The problem arises with those businesses that have not been specifically listed to close or have not been the benefited from the discretion that you've showed, like the, the lady with the gym, but who de facto have to close anyhow. And I raised a point yesterday in the budget debate that perhaps what we needed is some form of clause that enabled those who could prove, for instance, that 90 per cent of their trade had disappeared as a result of the restrictions could apply. Now, I'll give you three examples I'm dealing with. First of all, soft play areas. Soft play areas just do not work without a restaurant or a cafe, so they close, even though they're not on the list. Secondly, um, ferries. 
the ferry from Carlingford Ferry traded since day, not only because of our restrictions, but because the restrictions on the Irish Republic side are even more strenuous. So there's just nobody on the ferry. So they, they, they've had to close, they'll be closing down. There's, there's just absolutely no, no trade whatsoever. And the third one, interestingly, is dog kennels, where they're definitely not on your list, but um, because they're almost entirely dependent on the holiday trade, there's just nobody leaving their dog in to be kept. So they've had to close. Now, the, the problem is they are going to be left high and dry because the, the, the protection under the earlier scheme, the furlough, the bounce back loan, the £10,000 grant, the £25,000 grant, etc., were obviously much better than what's available now. And of course, you could, not, you could close yourself down. I had a quarry closed down, and then a week later, I thought, well, we don't need to close down. And therefore, they went back to business. But they could make that decision. Now, it's only if you're listed on the, in the regulations as having to close that you get the money. Can anything be done for that type of business? Not told to close, but must close. Um, well, this financial support scheme is designed to help the businesses which are required by the regulations to close. Um, I know that the Minister has encouraged his executive colleagues to bring forward schemes for businesses in other sectors which are you know, secondarily or indirectly affected by the, um, the current situation. So, businesses in the supply chain, for example, have made a number of representations, um, and some of the other kinds of businesses you mentioned, for example, the dog kennels, have been um, in contact with us quite a bit um, on the soft play areas. Um, so those would be the kinds of schemes that we think the Department of the Economy will be um, given consideration to. I understand that they are working up some proposals at this point for discussion by the executive. And when can we expect those to be revealed? Um, I am not privy to that because uh, that's the Department of the Economy is working on those. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, follow. Uh, my, mine is kind of a similar vein uh, to Jim's, and it, and it might even be more an interpretation of the regulations than, than the financial scheme, but you no. Know, I, I've been contacted by people uh, with similar problems. I mean, one, for example, that seems to be coming up all the time is bridal shops. So, you know, part of their business is maybe, I'm not an expert in bridal shops, so I hope I do them justice here, but uh, part of their business is front of, the, front of the shop where they're selling product, but part of their business is dress fitting. Uh, so, you know, when I have sought guidance, I'm kind of told that they're retail, so it can stay open. But part of what they do, or a big part of what they do, is actually dress fitting, which is close contact. Uh, so they're, they're not even sure whether they should be closed or not, and they're not even sure if they if they close, will they get the grant or whether they're entitled to it. So I mean, I do think that there probably is grey areas out there uh, that are keeping people who maybe should be should be closed open because they're uncertainty. So anything in terms of closing that gap of certainty would be would be much appreciated. Okay, um, there are a number of these um, cases which are, are coming forward and we'll have to try to work through what the um, regulations mean in practice for those kinds of, of businesses and what the what the implications will be. Um, I think there will be some difficult decisions to be taken around that. Um, the only thing I would suggest is if a business feels that they should be entitled to some kind of support to make an application, we will certainly consider those. And just to follow, I mean, can they? Is there a part because I know some hotels will be getting this grant, but staying open in certain circumstances? So, you know, is it the case that uh, you can still claim for this whilst being open, but your business is being affected? It's um, if the business has been severely curtailed in some way by the regulations. So the, the pubs would be an example of that. They are not strictly speaking to close completely, but they are restricted to takeaway service only or outdoor service for no more than 15 people, which is in most cases not a practical option for them. Cafe similarly um, restricted to takeaway business only. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Paul. Yeah, the same, same similar questions, Jim and Philip. So you have two scenarios whereby you have a large retail department store where within that, contained within that multi-storey building, there would be a cafe, restaurant, which is now forced to close, uh, with all the staff implications that comes with that. But yet the main bulk of the business mm -hmm. is most definitely not, but yet there's still that loss. Mm -hmm. And then you have this, the, 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 the other smaller businesses, like soft play areas, whereby whilst the soft player 
play area could open again where the logic <coughs> is as I have no idea but you, you're allowed a soft play area open the canteen or the cafeteria within that is critical because where do the parents sit uh, if that's not open uh, when their youngsters are in the soft play area so that would be the, the cafe culture within that soft play area would be much more uh, prevalent to the whole business model uh, so and then you have another scenario whereby you have a business within a business so you have a you have a restaurant within a golf club <coughs> two distinct businesses two different businesses but the smaller restaurant within the golf club won't pay rates uh, so in those three scenarios how, how many of them those cases would qualify and how many of them would be expected to be picked up by another tranche of scheme? Um, the, the current scheme is designed so that as any occupier of a business location or um, occupier of part of a business location which is um, required to close, so in the case of the large retail premises with the cafe or restaurant, um, if that's demarcated as another occupation within that building, even if they don't pay rates separately, then they will be entitled to. So I think that covers possibly the first and third of your examples. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so the, the soft play areas are, are more difficult um, because in most cases those will be sort of unitary businesses. So the um, the cafe is a sort of a secondary part of, of the of the facilities that are available. Um, we'll have to think through what that means in practice and what proportion of the business might be required. I think um, it is it is one of the more more difficult cases that we we have to to consider. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Pat. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Ian, thanks very much too for taking on board uh, last week that issue that was with the wet bars and having it resolved so quickly. Again, I want to go back just to a bar again. And most public houses are either licensed to sell, they're all licensed to sell on or off the premises. But there is a monopoly just at the moment when they're asked to close those that want to do food. There are those that don't have a separate off license attached to their fixed building are not allowed to sell alcohol now uh, off the premises through their main premises. Most bars have a small little area where you can go in and get your quarter or your half bottle of wine or bottle of wine. So they, they now have to close. The question is, is it possible to look at how that the police are enforcing them because their off sales is not inside the red line, which is the licensed premises? Uh, as the officers. I think that it is a monopoly as well that is forcing them to close and driving their patrons into the larger supermarkets when they're walking past their premises. Are you familiar with it or is it something that you might be able to look at for me? Um, well, enforcement wouldn't be with us. Like that. Not enforcement. They're not allowed to sell alcohol. Okay. They're licensed to sell on or off, but they're not allowed to sell it <coughs> from their premises. The police are saying them they don't have a separate off sales, but but their building is an off sales in total. They're licensed to sell either on or off. So I'm not worrying about the licensing side of it. I'm looking at the interpretation of that, where they are now being forced to close and they're not able to utilise that end of their business, which is probably about ten percent. Um, well, we wouldn't have. Um any, any role or, or, or knowledge or expertise in the enforcement side of these regulations. I think that's really a matter for the Department of Health and the Department of Justice. Uh, and licensing rules are, are um, they're looked after by the Department for Communities uh, right. as well, so they might be better positioned to advise you properly on, on how you those those things. But they find themselves that they're the well, right, Chair, they find themselves that they're not able to operate that side of their business. You know, so in a way, you, you, they've been told to close. Yeah. They're allowed to do uh, food yes. off the premises, so I'm not saying that they want to do a carry out just to deliver their food, but the facility is there, and it should, you know, we, we, it's something that I think you have to look at. I mean, it should be turned a blind eye to, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I believe that they're licensed to sell on and off, and the license shouldn't come into it at all. They should be allowed to sell alcohol through their main premises. I guess. Possibly a matter for the department. Or off the premises. Uh, TEO, though they will in any event be eligible for the support scheme. All right. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much indeed. Ian, have you got anything to add an amendment to that to yeah. SL, the SL1? 
Um, that's the oh, that's the SL5, oh, the oh, previous. Oh, um, yeah. So in relation to the new one, yes, the um, the SL1 relate, relates to the extension of the grant scheme across all parts of, of Northern Ireland. Um, so. The decision on this was taken on the 15th of October by the executive, so therefore it was the day after the previous regulations had been uh, made, uh, in which case we have to go back and, and um, adjust them. The principal issue here um, that is different from the previous scheme um, is that there is a wider range of businesses which are eligible to be um, supported by it. That includes things like hairdressers, um, beauticians and so forth. Um, and also, there, there are three rates of payment, and they are substantially higher than in the previous rates. So they are they are double what was um, previously um, previously being granted. Um, the, this scheme will apply from Monday past. That's the 19th of October. Um, we uh, will be taking the applications in um, as of nine o'clock this morning. We had seven and a half thousand applications already. Um, we won't be able to pay out until they get the regulations made, obviously. Um, so what we intend to do is pay the full four-week amount in one payment. Okay. Okay, Tim. Any questions? Very good. Okay. Just one quick question about Jim, the B and Bs. Uh, B and Bs are now going to be included on the basis that the tourist board certify them. That's correct. Yes. Um, yes, they are also registered with Environmental Health. Most of them. As well. Yes. Uh, but. Every B and B will only qualify, I presume, for the lowest tier because they're paying domestic rates, um, at a, which is rarely above fifteen thousand in an EV. Um, it, well, it obviously depends on the size of the business. Um, yes. So uh, a bed and breakfast establishment is rated as domestic if it has fewer than six bed yes. spaces available. Yes. Um, if it has more than six, then it's rated non-domestically. Um, so the larger premises may well be able to get higher tier. But your average run-of-the-mill B and B is to going be to be in the lowest B &B. tier. Yeah. There's no concession for them in that. Um, well, the, the concession is that they are they're now included, that they yeah. weren't previously included in any of the other grant mm. schemes, so they are now the domestically rated bed and breakfasts are included within this one. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Pat, quick one. Yes, it's just from the saloon and uh, uh, in Lisburn. It's just typical of what most of us are getting in the end, but uh, two of my new staff members will qualify for the new job retention scheme. They started in September, missed the cut off date, then he's now faced redundancy. Uh, that what they're trying to say is, uh, they, if you go into a saloon, you might have ten chairs and you rent out those chairs. You're familiar with it, but they find that they're not getting anything coming into them. The money is going to that, the owner of that. So, say it's three thousand pounds for two weeks, it's six thousand pounds for the for, for the month. They're not seeing any of that yet. They have invested in their bit that's inside that. Is there any way that that find those people that? Off date even from September, that there may be help them or with it. Is it, it and is indeed. Um, the, there will be one payment for each premise, I right. think. So, um, in, in situations like that, I think the, the owner and occupier of the premise will be the one who will be the recipient of the grant. If there are other um, people working from that, for, for example, the, the chairs, um, I think that's possibly some kind of arrangement to be made between the me an occupier and the others. No, um, I wouldn't um, like to force that arrangement. You know, um, but <laughs> it is, yeah, it's, it's a difficult situation. I understand that the Department of the Might be fair through the chair to maybe take that money and take that eight chairs and do it proportionately. Um, it would obviously be a lot different in every Pardon? place. That would be very different in every place. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the number of the number of hairdressers. But you are you are you are familiar with it that that it is uh, yeah. inadequate at the minute. Oh, small. Just, just on that point, the, 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 you need to be careful here because if you, you give a grant on a rates base and there's multiple uh, businesses within that, self-employed businesses within that, who then gets further support through other schemes which we hope are coming forward, you could end up that the proprietor of the business gets less than the, than the person who rents out a chair. 
so again, there will have to be some sort of level of regulation and fairness right across all of the schemes that we hope will be put in place, this only being one of them. One of the questions that's posed to me is last couple of days is, this money is simply not enough, and whilst we would be grateful for it, if we take it, will that rule us out for any other additional funding schemes, support schemes that may well be put into place in the next couple of weeks? Now, that's sort of like a bit of crystal ball gazing for you there, Ian. Mm -hmm. And it's not in your gift with regards to the other uh, schemes that may well come into play. What would you say to a business that might hold off from applying for this, which to me is measly money compared to the impact that the executive's decision has had on them? But you might find, and I, I think this is the case, that you might find that there's businesses who are querying whether to go for this or not over the next couple of days. Uh, what would you say to those businesses? And is there a cut-off as yet for this scheme? Um, for applications, no. Though, um, because it's uh, right into a four-week restriction period, we expect people will apply pretty quickly. Um, I would suggest that if you think you're eligible for this scheme, you should put an application in. Um, mm -hmm. If there are other schemes which might overlap with this one to some extent, though I'm fairly certain the Department of the Economy will attempt to minimise those overlaps, um, there will probably be some kind of offset of whatever other payments have been made. So, um, in the case of the ten and twenty thousand pounds, twenty-five thousand pound grant schemes earlier this year, um, some businesses might have been eligible for the 10000 under one valuation list and the 25000 under another. Mm -hmm. If they were paid the £10,000, then they got a top-up for the subsequent grant payment. I uh, understand that the Department of the Economy, one of the things it is considering, although I don't know um, what will emerge from this, is um, um, a different scheme for hotels, because clearly £6,000 is not really going to cover the cost of some of the larger hotels in, in Northern Ireland. But obviously, if we pay the grant to them, whatever the new scheme would deliver to them would have to be adjusted for whatever we had paid. Okay, thanks very much. Matthew, just a short one. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, maybe a couple of short ones. Um, thank you uh, again, Ian, for coming in and briefing us and, and for all the work your team's doing. Um, could you just remind us of where are we in terms of uh, rates reliefs up until the end of this financial year? What's, which, um, what sectors are uh, exempt from paying rates until in 1920 or 2021? Um, it's retail, hospitality, leisure, tourism, and the airports are the the sectors that are um, exempt from all rates for the or or have been relieved of all rates for the the entire 12 months. All other businesses received four months rate relief for April to July. Are there um, so so the the rates relief has ended then for businesses in um, in unaffected areas? Are you aware of particular businesses where? Who are perhaps they're secondarily impacted by the new restrictions. Mm -hmm. For example, if they were uh, grocery um, green grocery wholesalers who sold their food to the hospitality trade, um, are you aware of particular areas where there are people who could be supported by the rate system? Um, they are frequently getting um, correspondence from different kinds of businesses who yeah. are fairly severely affected by the the current uh, coronavirus um, impact on the economy. So there are. Uh, we already mentioned boarding kennels and calories is one yeah. one um, type of business. Um, there are people who provide um, models and um, you know, um, people for events and so forth. Events companies who run events and provide audiovisual equipment. Um, and so there are quite a broad range of people who have seen um, significant impact on their trade. Now they, there is a, a hardship rate relief scheme available. Um, that's for exceptional unforeseen circumstances that impact on your business, um, and then you. Um, have to demonstrate what impact that has had. Now, I would um, say that we all would accept that the coronavirus pandemic has been an exceptional and unforeseen circumstance, so yeah. that is not an issue. Um, the business will, however, have to demonstrate what the impact has been on their level of business um, as a result. So if you have lost 50% of your trade by comparison to this time last year, it should be a relatively easy thing to demonstrate, but you need to provide that evidence to the department. To, and that would have existed before COVID-19. Yes, uh, it's, been, it's been there for quite a while. How much is it? What's the total? Because we, we've had it in different announcements. What is the total cost of all the rates reliefs? Three hundred and thirteen million pounds. That's the total cost of foregone rates. Um, would you say it is? Uh, so, uh, two, two quick questions. Um, one: uh, Are you confident, or how much confidence do you have that? Even if there is a vaccine by spring and the economy is back to theoretically 
um, uh, close to being able to operate at capacity that you will have anything like your previous revenue levels um, uh, and secondly what work are you doing to model loss of revenue um, there, there are two aspects to that, I suppose. One is that um, you may remember, the committee will remember that we engaged um, Gareth Hetherington from the University of Ulster um, mm -hmm. earlier in the year to look at the rates relief package for the current financial year. Um, we're also going to do the same thing to look ahead to the 2021-22 uh, rating year to see what kind of targeted rate release might be appropriate you know, um, in, in the coming year. I would clearly imagine that, um, for example, the tourism sector will be one of those which will be quite severely um, affected in the next year as well as in this year. Mm -hmm. So it will be to, to try to determine what would be the best use of the resources that we have available to us by way of targeting rates relief at the most seriously affected um, types of sectors. Um, on the second issue about the modelling of what the rates revenue forecast will be, um, we want to work with district councils again to engage um, some academic support to try and model that kind of impact next year so that we can sort of see what the, uh, what the likely impact on rates revenues will be. Are you worried that the entire? Just once, just one second. I'm uh, sorry. I'm just trying to pick up the figure. Did, did Ian? Did you have a figure in mind for if we were going to extend the rates relief really for a year to the same for, for another year for the same sector? Is that part of the modelling? Um, that will, well, it hasn't been done yet, but we would have to have a look at what the options would be and how much the cost would be. Then this is my final question. Um, do you think? Uh, are, are you worried? Or do you think that the COVID-19 has basically so fundamentally changed economic activity that the entire model of non-domestic rates um, will have to change in order to be uh, functional, really? And that's not a, just a Northern Ireland-specific thing. That's just a, a challenge happening in developed con economies generally, that it has clearly accept, both revealed and accelerated a trend towards you know that is basically minimizing certain physical for physical retail for example in the, in the most stark sense does it worry you that it looks like we might be moving towards a completely fundamentally transformed um, sort of uh, world in which non-domestic rates can't really be relied upon anymore um, yeah th there are going to be some significant changes um, um, in business activity and, and, and patterns. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, the current situation um, means that the majority of non-domestic rates in the current financial year are being covered by the executive, either um, from direct payment of rates itself for public sector buildings or for reliefs. Um, so once you get to that extent, um, then you... The majority of, of rates... So it's sort of circular, basically. The majority of rates revenue to LPS at the minute is coming from the public sector. Um, yes, either relieved or it comes from the public sector in one way or another. Non-domestic or all rates? Uh, Non-domestic. So um, that then um, it brings into, into stark relief some of the issues, which I think we discussed whenever I was here on the 5th of February about, um, I think Mr. Free asked me a question if I was William Pitt. You know, would I design the rate system? Um, I don't think... Uh, that was a great question. It was. Yeah. <laughs> um, Through the but, chair. <laughs> but it was... Um, um, it, it does get the heart of, of yeah. what the, uh, what's the best way to organise the rate system. It's, it's a very complicated system in Northern Ireland uh, in the sense that a large number of properties are valued but no rates are paid on them. Um, and the, um, there's a complicated system of release for different types of businesses in different sets of circumstances. Um, having said that, property tax is a very efficient form of tax in the fact that the property is there, it's, it's visible, it's very difficult to evade the tax and it's easy to collect. So I don't think I can ever envisage a situation where there would be no property tax on business, but whether it is supplemented with or complemented by um, some other kinds of taxation for new kinds of business activity. That's that's a that's a. But it's the kind of economic activity that's happening in those physical structures, which is the, which is the the thing that's changing so fundamentally. Um, it, some of, some of it is. Um, there will have to be, I think, in fairly short order, another revaluation of non-domestic property to reflect the, um, the changing economic pattern. So in Scotland, England, and Wales, it has been announced that there will be another revaluation in 2023. Um, let's bring it forward by one year. Um, the, the minister will, will be considering whether or not to do likewise in Northern Ireland. But non-domestic rates are basically, at the minute, the, it's in effect costing the executive more, it's, it's more of a drain than a revenue raiser, as it were. 
Um, I and I know we're straying, we're straying a bit yeah. off here, but you're saying sort of potentially looking at a reval for 2023? Um, that, that's one of the things that we would be keen to, to look at, um, whether that is doable. Bearing in mind but, but there's no decision case. taken on it yet. I mean, I have to be quite clear about that. There's no decision. On it. Yeah. Sorry, Matthew. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm doing, if I'm calculating it correct in my own head. But if it's more than 50 percent, is it? it now and obviously, this is in the context of COVID. Is it a net? Is the, currently this is in the context of COVID? Mm -hmm. Are non-domestic rates a, and as it were, net cost to the executive rather than a rev? The, than its um, only revenue either. That's um, um, it. That would be a, a kind of a difficult um, right question because it's not as straightforward as a, as a question makes it sound. There are yeah. um, rates which are paid by the public sector, yeah. so that is sort of circular money. Um, and then there are rates release, which are essentially rates <coughs> foregone. So that's not a net cost. It's simply that it's not money that's collected. Um, there is um, the, the frictional cost of managing all of these things is would be significant. So if you're not taking rates off people who are exempt, for example, or um, who would never pay rates, but you're still valuing the property, then there are administrative costs to go yeah. alongside that too. Okay. But it's but it is certainly, well, yeah, that's fine. I think you've asked enough. Thanks, Matthew. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't want this to turn into another evidence session about the future of the Northern Ireland rating system, but we'll have one of those later on, I think, uh, committee. I think that was uh, an interesting and indeed something we probably need to look at <coughs> if we're going to produce a stimulus package to be able to help business. That might be something we need to look at. Ian, thank you very much indeed again. Sure. And uh, hopefully it'll be, won't be next week or the week after we see you again, but. Uh, 18th of November. Yeah, yeah. Don't be a stranger. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Ian. <laughs> Okay, Tim, moving on. Uh, I need to seek your agreement for statutory road 2020 221. And may I ask the uh, committee if you're in agreement that the Committee for Finance has considered statutory road 2020 221, financial assistance coronavirus regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? No. Now I move on to the SL1, and I think we've discussed the SL1. Are we content on the SL1? If we are, if I move on, if the members of the state agree, are in agreement, the committee has considered the Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus No. 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Are we content? content. Can I move on to agenda number nine of six, SL1, draft administration of a state's small payments increase of limit order Northern Ireland 2020. Draw the members' attention to the briefing note on page 50. The SL1 itself on page 52, and I think there was one consultation uh, letter came from the uh, came in from the uh, Irish League of Credit Unions on page 23, and that's the thing that you uh, raised, raised said your notice on, wasn't it, uh, Melissa? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'd just like to comment on that as well too. And I think it's appropriate when they talk about the twenty thousand limit there, and that uh, credit union provides, you know, from within the community itself. And a lot of the shareholders in that in credit union can be small share shareholders as such, small savings. But that it carries with it an insurance policy that in the event of death before a certain age, those savings then are doubled and given to the next to kin. So if someone is there, we'll say, with uh, four or five thousand pounds of savings, and it's doubled in the event of their death, we say, and I think it may be before seventy years of age. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see straight away that where that would have implications in terms of costs uh, to a family, maybe they would be totally and absolutely dependent on it. So that I think that the recommendations there are appropriate and appropriate for the support that it needs. Okay, thank you very much, Anybody, sir. Uh, the statutory rule will increase the small payments limit, as most has pointed out, from 10,000 10, to 20,000 on the amount of money that may be released to the beneficiaries of a deceased person from that person's estate by certain organisation without the need for a grant of probate. The rule is subject, uh, subject to affirmative resolution, assemb uh, the affirmative resolution assembly proce procedure, which is made, printed and laid before the assembly, and shall not come into operation unless affirmed by the assembly. The anticipated date for that rule will come into operation will depend on timing of assembly business. I ask the members to note a short targeted consultation ran for eight weeks over the summer months. Despite assistance from colleagues in the Department of Economy to raise awareness of the consultation, only one response was received from the Irish League of Credit Unions, and we thank them for that. And well, if Mr. Chairman, it's worth saying that is the organisation. 
I wouldn't just say it's just one consultation. It is, it the, is consultation. the organization. Yep. Thank you. Well, we thank them for it anyhow. I think we are in agreement. We thank them for that. And therefore, if we're in agreement, members, that the committee has considered Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation draft administration of estates, small payments, increase of limit order in Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of this at the propose of the proposed legislation at this stage. Are we content? Great. We want item number seven, written briefing, raised paper and overview of COVID funding in Northern Ireland and the economic implications. The briefing paper is page 61, which provides an overview of the key economic implications of COVID and the government funding made available to Northern Ireland at central and devolved levels. The paper provides contextual information on the Northern Ireland economy prior to and during the pandemic before looking at future challenges faced by businesses and citizens, which the executive and the assembly will need to address. Members, have we any comments? I have a particular comment because I thought this was a very well uh, put together paper. And I think it's not often the RCC in one paper, all the sort of the key areas put in an area. And I think we should be thank passing on our thanks to Rays for this. Look, Rays do a great job at the best of times, but at the moment, some of the work they're bringing in is absolutely outstanding. Uh, I would just like to have seen that degree of, um, let's say, uh, diligence in their work and uh, the output of other government departments. And I think things would be much better off. But members, are we content to note? No. I'm very content. And I just note too, but that uh, in the graph that they have there, our diagram and it's page 26, uh, and it shows uh, Northern Ireland uh, the blue, which is total value, uh, total loan value, and then the green is the uh, business of as a percentage of the business population. And I actually think that that has been presented wrongly. There it should have been the other way around. Uh, because in the paragraph before that, it said that uh, that the total loan value was uh, two percent of that percentage of uh, business population for Northern Ireland, which is two and a half percent. I, I apologise, Melissa, if that is the case, and I I will get them to correct the thing. But uh, I can only print out in black and white, so I didn't get a chance to see the <laughs> difference in colours. Um, but we get the message, and we thank you from looking at that little diagram. But. Okay. Uh, members, during yesterday's debate on the Budget No. 3 Bill, the Minister stated that the propositions are not brought, brought forward quickly by departments to help those people who have not been left behind in the allocation of support for COVID-19. You will have to allocate that money elsewhere through the Executive. Of the £600 million that was set aside from the COVID allocation for health, the Minister stated that over £500 million has been identified as being needed. We have already heard from the Minister today about the additional £200 million in con consequentials. And they, with the 100 million not required by health and the 55 million held centrally, albeit the 35 million of that will be used to provide support in the SL1 we described, that is somewhere around about 350 million pounds. Uh, I would like to get your agreement to get confirmation of the exact figure currently awaiting allocation and relocation in year, and ask the department of any other support schemes that are ready to go in the advanced stages of development, subject to receiving this funding. Now, I think the minister made quite clear that. that uh, the money is there. He is looking for both the Department of Economy, the Department of Infrastructure, and the Department of Communities to come forward with particular bids. And I think we should be looking at those as soon as they've come forward. And I think the clerk's just pointed out to me that there's just been an announcement made by the Minister for the Economy about a proposal to come forward. But rather than sort of taking our time here, maybe we'll have a time to reflect over that over the next week, and then we'll be able to come back for those answers uh, later on if we are content. Yep. Uh, moving on to chairperson's business, we have had a letter from Girl Guiding Ulster, which I have, of course, have declared an interest on. My daughters both being brownies, for the chairperson to zoom the, to a Zoom event on Wednesday, the fourth of November, to discuss persistent and unfair barriers uh, to girls and young women. And as the father of four daughters, I can readily identify with that. If you are content, I will take that Zoom meeting. Okay, content. Uh, moving on to correspondence from the chairperson of the Committee for the Economy to the Minister of Finance regarding financial support for those who have to self-isolate it, page 103. Do we have any comments? <coughs> uh, can we ha seek your agreement to, for the, to ask the Minister to forward his response to the Committee? Great. From the chairperson of the Committee for the Economy to the Minister of Finan Finance regarding the impact of the new COVID-19 restrictions, on page 106. Do we have any comments? Are we content to note? 
Uh, if we move on to the Committee for Communities to the Ministry of Finance regarding correspondence from NIPSA on page 108. Do we have any comments? Are we content to note? Thank you. Seek agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence and to forward the information request to the department. Are we content? Jim, do you want to come in? I just want to ask one question. Um, I want to ask the clerk. Was there a letter from the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Justice relating to my private member's bill? Because I got such a letter on Friday and it said within it it was being forwarded to the committee. As far as I'm aware, I, I haven't seen it, so I'll, I'll check. But as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been in because usually everything is forwarded to me. Yeah. Okay. Are you indicating? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I did get something. I thought it was from yourself, Jim. Yes, I no, said, you got, we got some from Jim, but I didn't. Yeah. I don't think it's gone. It has to go to the clerk okay. to be an official record of the committee. No, no. Okay, we're content. We move on to the forward work program. Uh, team, just before I start, the 4th of November meeting is quite busy, but I think we should, as a priority, take within that a schedule uh, October monitoring evidence. And I think that was sort of, I think it was indicated by the minister that we will have the statement, and we will have it by then. Are we content? No. Okay. Uh, for, updated forward work programme is at page 141. Uh, the department is scheduled to provide oral evidence to the committee and review of the financial process. Uh, advise members this review will potentially overhaul the financial process with a view of providing increased transparency to aid financial scrutiny. And may I put on record our thanks for Jim again raising that issue and again indicates that our committee has been working well together in raising the issue around black boxes. And I think uh, for most people who uh, have difficulties of wading through the detail and the information, I think I would like to put my sort of thanks uh, on the members of the committee for doing their work and being diligent. And I think having sat through both days of the sort of within the finance minister and listening to the various bills that came through, I thank you all for your hard work and diligence and sort of raising the issues as they came forward. If we're content to receive a presentation from Ray's Public Finance Scrutiny Unit in advance of the oral evidence session, provide context for the session, I think we are. Great. Uh, four members of the draft report and the committee stage of the function of government miscellaneous provisions bill has been scheduled for consideration on the 4th of November. And can we just chase up that letter from the Justice to yeah. so that's part Sorry, of the process? Yep, thanks. And uh, if members are con content to consider the bill report on the 4th of November, it will be a busy day, but I think it's important that we, we progress with this. Great. Great. Uh, advise members that in order to give members sufficient opportunity to consider the bill report, the committee officer are endeavouring to issue papers for the 4th of November meeting this Friday. And I think we're going to achieve that, aren't we, Jim? It's looking very much so, Terry. Yeah. Uh, Four members raise has agreed to provide a written analysis and presentation of the forecast outturn quarterly report at the meeting on the 2nd of December. Happy with that. Uh, I'd like to seek an agreement to receive a written analysis and raise presentation on the 2nd of December with respect to that. Agreed. Uh, the Department has sent a paper to the clerk summarising the ongoing development process for the proposed East Plus programme. The Department is proposing to undertake an eight-week consultation on the proposals during November and December. And, yeah, and I think the Minister today made clear with the, some of the difficulties of looking at sort of the Peace Plus money and sort of the wider money that we are expecting from Europe. I think the issue of not having the finance bill before us or having been presented in Westminster is going to make uh, issues quite difficult. But I do think it's important we at least understand the quantum of that money and the sort of the likely difficulties we're happen to have. So we're content uh, to consider the paper of the meeting on the 4th of November and to receive oral evidence from departmental officials on the proposals on the 11th. Are we content? Are we therefore content for the forward work programme for rest of rest of the year? Thank you. Members, do we have any other business? Hasn't been notified. So. Right. Uh, please take the opportunity over the next week to either recharge your batteries, but whatever you do, Keep on washing your hands, keep on wearing your face mask, keep on staying two metres away from everybody. And I don't want anybody coming down with this horrible lurgy. But uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your hard work during this first quarter. And uh, enjoy yourselves. And Pat, apparently you're, uh, we're all going out in Halloween to scare everybody is now sort of uh, gone viral. Oh, so boy. where are you done? At least somebody watches us. <laughs> okay, everybody, uh, next meeting, uh, 4th of November at 2 o'clock in here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, 
Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program signed.